Hi, this is Regina Y. Favors with the Homosexual Squatter. So I'm coming to you with a new series, Overcoming Homosexual Setback. I don't know if I'm going to make it a full series, but I will sort of separate the videos um, into separate uh, components. But I want to get into this discussion about the Homosexual Squatter. Everyone has been posting videos on YouTube and um, sort of like as a warning tool, warning videos about uh, now that we are hitting the colder months, you will find for women, many men wanting to come live with them. They don't have a place of their own. They usually don't keep a stable job if they keep a job. And they're looking to um, do whatever they have to do to get into your house into a woman's house so they would have somewhere to stay uh, all the way up into the spring uh, time, like once it becomes kind of warmer. And then they'll basically move on. And the homosexual really is the vagabond that we uh, have of old that we really know about, uh, that we have seen in movies and they're kind of like a wanderer and they don't have any life purpose, mission. They kind of do odd jobs, right? They'll do odd jobs and um, and there's no real life goal for them. When it comes to a romantic partner being a homosexual, however, it can be a little dangerous because if you decide that things are not working out, the person, the man is not providing, not contributing, not doing anything around the house, maybe even cheating with an ex who won't let him come uh, live with her, and that person is involved in your relationship with the person, um, when you find that there are too many factors that might lead to violence, you have to make a decision about homosexual, about the homosexual. And I am linking homosexual and squatter um, because of once you decide to try to kick the person out and the person refuses to leave, then under a legal definition, possibly they may become a squatter. Because if they're a homosexual, you usually invite them in. You usually say, yeah, you can stay here. You, you can live with me. Let's live together. Let's do whatever we're going to do, right, as two romantic uh, uh, people, uh, as a couple. However, when you do your, you're getting tired of him, you're slamming doors around the house, you're trying to pack his stuff, he's trying to keep from leaving, uh, he, he convinces you to stay by giving you sex, he never gives you any money, never gives you, you, you any money, never puts any money on the food or anything like that, and when you try to, try to kick him out, and you, you, you don't follow through with that decision, like actually execute that decision and you let him stay, then he basically becomes a squatter. And is he is a permitted squatter after that because and, uh, for, for legal definition purposes, and I'm not a lawyer, uh, but just in researching the term, when you, um, when a person who is living with you receives mail at your place, they basically take up residence. And so they may be a squatter, because you didn't necessarily say, hey, I want you to stay. And at the same time, you did say, hey, I want you to stay. Because as long as, as long as the person is still in your house, you are permitting it. But when you try to kick them out for good, that's when it becomes a squatter situation for you. Because it's hard to then uh, tell the police officer you no longer want the person there. It's hard to then file any sort of legal documents like a um, a restraining order, you have to show a lot of proof for that. Uh, it's hard to uh, evict if the person decides to try to give you some money on the rent. As soon as you take anything from the person, you put yourself in a legal dilemma because now the person can claim that you too agreed uh, for the person to pay you rent and just because you didn't pay the full amount, you pay something, and then it's hard to get that person out. <clears throat> the best the best strategy for dealing with a homosexual and then homosexual squatter is just not to let the person come live with you. The person is a grown individual. Now, we all have had some times where we were 
uh, down um, financially and we had to go and live with somebody or we had to um, work it out, you know, some kind of way, had to ask for uh, some money. But if the majority of your life, 99% of your life, 95% of your life has been you taking care of yourself, then you are a grown adult. You know how to be a grown adult. But when you get somebody who has never had a place of his own, and we can add women to the mix as well as homosexual squatters, a person who has never had a place of his or her own, never had a job, never went to school, dropped out of school, not trying to do anything for their grown selves, then you're going to run the risk of dealing with a homosexual squatter, and it's going to be hard to get that person out. So this is the homosexual squatter overcoming homosexual setback. Um, visit ReginaWhyFavors.com. I think I'm going to place this under the tab um, life recovery tips or homeless recovery tips. And 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 um, I finalized that thought afterwards. What is a homosexual? So <clears throat> a homosexual is an individual, typically a man, who moves in with a woman for the purpose of having somewhere to live and not to be homeless. So the goal is to not to be homeless. The goal is not for a, homose a homosexual to go and get a job to make sure he or she has a place. The goal is just not to be homeless in the moment. So that means that's seasonal for them, that's uh, momentary for them, is temporary for them. And they are fine moving uh, between houses and between people and between couches and between you know, outside at, at, at times, sometimes in a shelter, but they, but their goal is to basically not be homeless. Well, that's, that really should be everybody's goal if you are a grown adult, but if you are perpetuating that for so long and you're not doing anything about it during the warmer months, I mean, yeah, during the uh, cooler uh, and um, hotter months, okay, and then you wait all the way to the cold weather comes along and so you're not homeless again, to, to, you, you you seek someone uh, to live with so you're not homeless again, that means you have no other aim but just not to be homeless. Homosexual can also be a woman who chooses a friend or a relationship to seek shelter and resources. So we've all had, we've all had, as women, we've all been exposed to a friend or a man. We've all been exposed to a male friend. They just kind of move from place to place they they always need some couch to lay on and they claim sometimes they blind us into thinking that they don't need help somehow what they do is they will um uh, do this thing they will stay at your house all the way till about nine or ten sometimes 11 or 12 and say man i'm kind of tired to drive uh um uh, or or catch the bus man can i sleep on your couch just you know you know, tonight, right? And they'll do that. And the goal is to move in little by little. I had a guy who I didn't even realize he was a homosexual. I literally, honestly did not. I had my own place. And it seemed like to him that he was roommating with someone. And so I just assumed that when he spent all his time in my place, that he just wanted to spend time with me. No, that, that was not the case. What it is, he started moving in little by little. And I didn't notice it at the beginning. Like he would leave a sock behind or he would leave some clothes behind or something like that. And the, and the goal is to say, yeah, I get it. When I come back, they start changing clothes at your house. They start taking showers at your house. And if you're in a romantic relationship, you really don't see anything uh, with it because then at the same time, you're getting sex from the person. And so that blinds you to the reality of that person actually being a homosexual in your life. But a woman can do the exact same thing. If she, if she was coddled and babied by her own mother or father, uh, she's going to look for another person to do exactly what her mother and father uh, did. When I was in a shelter for a short time during the financial recession, there was this young lady, a sweet girl, uh, and um, she, was, she was definitely younger than me. She was about 19, maybe 19, 20. I don't know. And so she was um, she was in the shelter. Um, um, she had left her parents' house, got an apartment with someone. It didn't work out. And then she ended up going to the shelter. And um, 
when she did that, uh, I noticed that there were some uh, aspects of herself that she sort of didn't understand or, or whatever. And, uh, but she was kind of needy. She was clingy. She was a, a person who wanted to be around you all the time. And that tells me that the mother um, likely coddled her but it was the father who told the mother that she had to go. And so that's why she was actually out. And if she didn't look like the type of person who caused a bunch of trouble or something like that, she just kind of seemed like the type of person um, who just didn't have any aim at that time, who was just kind of struggling to find her own way. And we have all done it. If we didn't plan our way in our high school years, like try to go to college, go to the military, um, you know, get a job or, or something like that, we're going to wander aimlessly uh, around for a good number of years. We got to attach ourselves our, attach ourselves to something to begin to um, really live life in a very conscious way. And so uh, there were times when I would take her along with me because I was trying to make money and I was doing freelance writing at the time when everyone was trying to set up their websites and they needed content and I was writing that content. And, uh, and I would take her loan. And then there were times, and, and then when I took her loan, she just didn't seem like she wanted to, here it is, she got access to a computer for the first time because I would take her to the library, to university library, where I could do my work because I didn't have a computer, I think. I, I had to pawn it. And she just, here it is, you have access to a computer for the first time uh, and you're not doing anything and you're bored. What she wanted to do was go to the movies, she wanted to do the the um, sort of like entertaining part of life. But you don't understand that you are a grown adult now. You need to begin making decisions for yourself. You can't live in a shelter forever in the same way that I said to myself. And um, that was, and prior to that, I had always had my own place. I didn't have a problem with that. It's just that I lost my job. We were in a financial recession, um, dealing with family, you know, and, um, it was one of those things that I had to kind of really quickly understand. And so a lot of times when you find a woman who is a homosexual squatter or homosexual at this time, she, she is usually the type of person who was babied by somebody. And she was really groomed to marry right out of, um, out of her parents' house. She not, she wasn't necessarily groomed to actually uh, have a job and, and go to college or something like that. She was groomed really to be a wife to someone, but whoever she got with, it didn't work out. And so um, when you have a friend or relationship, um, a lot of times, if they spend a lot of time at your house, they're always taking showers at your house and um, running up your light bill and all that kind of stuff. That's usually, I would really take note of that person to see if they actually have a place to live. So homosexuals are akin to squatters with one exception. A squatter, by definition, is a person who unlawfully occupies an uninhabited building or unused land. So we have, we've been uh, seeing lately, um, like in the news, a lot of um, squatters moving into abandoned buildings, moving into apartments where the people, where the renters are out of town on vacation, and they have to call the police on them. We just been seeing a lot of this lately. And what I think that is, is that some of these people who are homeless, they're tired. They're tired of living on the street, but they don't know how, to, but they don't want to go the long way around to do what they need to do. Like go into the shelter, um, talk to a caseworker, get your name on the list, maybe get into one of the programs, right? To secure you some housing for at least 18 months and then transition after that. They don't want to do that. They want they want uh, immediate housing. And what I say with people who who um, who end up homeless like like double digit years, they waited too long. It's not like they cannot change and go and get a, a place to live because you see that too. You see a lot of people who have been homeless for years and now they are moving into like tiny homes or something like that because at the time as time goes on, you get tired of that life. You get tired of laying on the concrete and, and having to worry about who's going to touch you 
and whether or not someone is going to uh, commit violence. And then you just get tired of the elements. You get tired of the weather. And so I think with that, uh, people who are homeless, they tend to wait too long. If you're homeless 25 years, I read a article, The Guardian, on this, and he was homeless for 25 years. Now, he ended up getting a place. But if you're homeless for 25 years, that's too long. You waited too long to get yourself together. Um, so the squatter, by definition, is someone who unlawfully occupies, right? They don't have permission. They can be unused land. So like you have this big, big ranch, goes on for miles, right? And one part of that uh, ranch, you can't see with, with your naked eye. So it's easy, even if you put up no trespassing signs and things like that, it's easy for someone to find a way to camp on that site without you knowing it. Unless you have roving uh, um, police officers or security or something like that, it's easy to do. But if they stay on your land for so so many um, so much time, according to state law for squatting, they have rights. They definitely have rights. It'll be hard to evict them. So that's why you have to always be mindful of even the property that you have. However, a woman or man can permit a homosexual to squat in their homes. The person may become a squatter under the legal definition after he or she is asked to leave but refuses to leave. When legal reasons exist, the person is no longer a homosexual. The person is a squatter. So let's look at this. Homosexuals are permitted into your home because you open the door to permit them. But when you are going through this process of trying, uh, you've made the decision to try to get them out for good, and you're even going to the courthouses and things like that, then, um, and the judge says, well, did he pay you some money? Did he give you something or whatever? Yes, I took it. Okay, then he he can stay. He can still stay. Um the process will have to go under the appeal, things like that. And so now he becomes a squatter in your life, in your house. It's hard to get him out. The person can bring somebody else in your house. And the thing is, what ends up happening if the landlord or rental office finds out that you have that person in the house, you can actually be evicted. But then if there is some sort of legal issue with the squatter in the house, the squatter could make a make a case that he's supposed to be there. So it gets very messy legally. That's why it's better just to let grown people take care of grown people. Mission and purpose. So the mission of a homosexual squatter, so now we're in the context of a homosexual squatter, uh, no longer just just a homosexual. The mission of the homosexual squatter is to, is to secure a temporary dwelling to establish territorial dominance. That's what these people really do. It's just like a romantic relationship when it comes to rebounding. They, uh, the person doesn't have any uh, uh, intent to want to be with you, but they're going to rebound between you and a person that they really want uh, who is not coming around. They just got out of a relationship six months or less, and the person that they really want to be with is just uh, uh, you know, sort of acting up. And so they're going to use your house, your 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 resources, your shelter, your money, your finance, your body, to to um, establish some sort of secure place until they can convince the other person, the the main person, uh, to accept them back. And so they'll continue to stay in your house um, based upon your own permission. You. You continue to let the person in because you have deluded yourself into believing that it is a relationship, but that's on, But that delusion is based upon what they have been selling to you as a dream. They sell to you, okay, we're working together. We're going to be together. We're going to be engaged. We're going to marry. This is us. We're a couple. Whatever they're trying to sell you in that moment. But you don't know that they're actually lying to you. They're their goal really is to establish territorial territorial dominance because as soon as they secure a place with you, they're, they're going to move to another place, not physically, but mentally to another woman and secure territorial dominance with her. So that if the main person kicks him out again, he would have 
a whole dating rotation of people that he can go and live with. The purpose of the homosexual squatter is to rebound between dwellings, houses, shelters, places to establish territorial rank. Because once they're in your house, they, they sort of think like they are the king of the house because they have, because they're men, they just automatically think that they have like patriarchy over your home. Even though you're the one paying the bills, you're the one uh, has to, uh, you secure the place, it's your place, you are on the lease or on the mortgage. But that doesn't matter to them because they can keep you blinded um, as long as they can uh, without you seeing the situation for what it really is. And, and people tend to really kick somebody out when it comes to finances, that you're not contributing anything at all. And when it comes to a point in your life where you're struggling and you're looking to that person to contribute something, because after all, they've been living here like living with you the whole time and they refuse, that's when you get upset. And then a lot of times if you find out they uh, refuse, you, it's a crossroad moment too. You can continue to stay with the situation or you can uh, begin the exit uh, planning process. Regardless, their goal is to rebound between uh, dwellings, houses, shelters, places to establish territorial rank. The homosexual creates the homosexual squatter creates a purpose to use you and to use your resources. In other words, they purpose to use you. I had a uh, a guy uh, when I was first coming out of high school, and he ca he he called himself uh, wanting to be interested in me, and I visited him um, in San Diego, and I thought we had we were on our way to something or whatever. And at the time, I was kind of still I was I was out of high school. I graduated. But I didn't plan for that transition. I didn't plan for the after graduation process. So I was working retail part time. And uh, then I eventually got a full time uh, job, I think, or something like that. And uh, and it was with a call center. And so um, when he wanted when he asked me to visit him, I went to visit him and everything. And I and, and then he said says to me, uh, right when I get there, um, that, uh, don't fall in love with him or something like that. Right. Don't fall in love with him. And I was confused. I, it, it didn't make any sense. Why am I here? And I wasn't in love with him or anything like that. It was very new, but the fact that he sort of put the brakes on whatever could have become with us was very, very disconcerting. And I, and I was only going to be there a week, and I didn't have any money to get back on my own because I think he paid for the trip. And then we go to the uh, church. And no, we didn't do anything or anything like that. But we go to the church, and there's this other woman that he's kind of looking at. And, I'm, and, and, and I just thought it was kind of weird. And right, bef uh, right before that, oh, no, after that, um, we get back home, and he's calling this woman in front of me. And I'm thinking, why is he calling another woman? And I'm here. And I was very naive. I think I was like 18, going on 19 or something like that. I was extremely naive. I didn't know that kind of stuff. I didn't have, uh, I had a, a boyfriend in high school and that was very short term. And then I didn't have relationships after that uh, prior to him. And so I didn't understand. And I, and I addressed it with him. I said, why are you calling somebody um, um, in front of me? right? Just wait to call her after I leave. And so he still did it. He, he didn't care. And so then, um, we went to church again. And then, um, when he needed to take the girl and her brother's home, now I was riding a uh, shotgun in the front seat, right? Cause I would think that I would have that uh, privilege since I am visiting him. And since he, and since he wanted me to visit him, no, uh, I didn't have that privilege at all. He had um, completely replaced me in a sense that she got the front seat. Now, she was wrong to go to the front seat first, but he didn't say anything. And then I'm sitting up there in the back seat. And so so we moved positions. Whether he uh, caused it or not, we ended up moving positions. So I, I moved from front to back. And and uh, w when I got there to the car, she was already in the front seat and he didn't tell her to get up or anything like that. And um, 
long story short, I realized uh, through reflection, uh, sometimes a little bit during that time, but much later when I felt like I needed to go through a healing process, that he actually purposed to use me, that he wanted to ask me to come down there uh, to make her jealous so that she could come around emotionally and psychologically to him and give him a chance. And then once that was fulfilled, I was, uh, I, he, he basically kicked me out of my position. And again, he didn't necessarily declare me as a position, like I'm a girlfriend or something like that. But I wouldn't necessarily think that you would ask someone to come down there and see you just to use that person in order to make another woman jealous. But that is exactly what he did. So the homosexual squatter will create a purpose to use you and to use your resources, meaning that if that person is right out of, out of a relationship, guarantee, I can guarantee he's rebounding with you. He's not, he's not uh, emotionally ready to be in a relationship, right? If he is, if he just lost his job, he's rebounding with you. It's not romantically, but it's, um, it's financially because he's using you to use your resources. Because anyone who has resources, money, job is going to be open about, hey, I'm wondering, can we sit down and talk about how much I can pay? I know that I can pay $300. Would that be okay? Or $300 plus food. Would that be okay? People who are on the up and up are going to be on the up and up. They don't have to uh, scam you out of anything. But when you find that they are withholding their resources, they won't tell you what they're making. They're eating up the food, coming in the house whenever they want to. Uh, they, they purpose to use you. And then the homosexual squatter is intentional. So the, uh, so the person is intentional about what they're doing. That means when they are intentional, they are conscious about what they're doing. Now, people don't always um, understand the, the true implications of, of their decision making. They don't see the consequences of the decision that they're making concerning you. They don't see that if they continue to push this ideology that I don't have to pay you anything, that it's going to lead to the consequences of, of being kicked out. They don't see it like that. They because they know that they can pull another bag out of their tricks and then you'll change your mind. So uh, when they um, you, you know this to be true because the squatter, just in a general legal sense, they were intentional in moving into your house, eating up your food, ruining the place, the damaging the place, uh, 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 um, refusing to leave. Right. If you uh, I've seen this. uh one or two cases on YouTube where the person uh, rented out her room, tried to act like a Airbnb, uh, didn't read contracts, things like that, right? So she rented out her room. And then when it came to the end of the state, the person wouldn't leave. They, per they were intentional. They purposed to use the place and the resources. Same thing about a dentist, a million dollar home. There was this lady who stayed in this house for many months, she just refused to leave. So that tells you right there, if they are walking into your home, they, they are already scanned it and looked around to see uh, what is available to them uh, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, financially, and they are going to set up camp and it, it'll be hard to get them out. All right, characteristics of a homosexual squatter. So the homosexual squatter does not need shelter. I need you to understand this. It seems like they do, but they don't need shelter. They don't need money. They don't need sex. They just need a house. So what they'll do is they will pretend for you in different ways. They'll give you sex. Uh, they may even, the first time they get access to money, give you a little bit of something just to pretend like y'all are in a relationship and y'all are working together and this is going to work out and I know he's the one and I know she's the one type crap. But they don't really need what you think they need. They need a, a, a dwelling, a house, because they would turn around and move from your shelter, the place that you are providing for them. They would turn around and move from your place to another place. So that tells you, because anyone who needs shelter is going to do the steps, commit to the steps of, of, of getting a job, doing what they need to do to keep that job, getting a place, doing what they need to do to keep that place, and not have to depend on other people unless there is a dire emergency type situation. But they don't need shelter. 
not in the sense that we we need shelter not in the sense that we got to have our own place not in the sense that we got to uh keep our own place because we don't want to live with a relative we don't want to live with our mother or father or brother or sister right not in the sense that uh, i would rather keep my own place even though i got a man or even though i got a woman not in that sense they don't need shelter in that sense they don't need money they because they know that they can rebound between multiple people to get money that's why you'll hear some of these uh youtubers talk about you know dating rotations because they can they'll use a woman they'll purpose a woman to be uh, a companion a friend they will purpose a woman to be uh, a cook a purpose a woman to be um, uh, a vice um, sexual part partner a lot of times they have sex with all those women because they know if if they want to be able to get any money out of them they're gonna have to uh, sort of prostitute themselves they will purpose a woman who gives them money i've heard uh stories about men who can get 100 dollars from one woman 200 dollars from another 50 dollars, 25 dollars uh 75 dollars and by the end of that sort of sort of negotiations with those women he got his rent he got his car payment he got some food because a lot of women will also stock the refrigerator right with food um, and so he basically is living a high life that that can't last long because some of these women are going to find out about each other, but they don't need money. A lot of times they have money. They just hoard it. They don't tell you that they have money uh, and who and, and however way they use their money is for the person who doesn't want them. Men tend to uh, be stingy with women who want them, uh, who are good for them, and they uh, tend to give a whole lot of money. To women who don't want them because that woman is always calling sometimes it's a jezebel spirit uh i had one uh ex who um whose ex told him that i can call you anytime i want to and i know you come running okay that's a jezebel spirit so they don't need money they need money for another type of purpose like they're trying to convince whoever uh uh, to be with them, to be with them. And, and look, I'm going to go get a job and I'm going to go get a place and I'm going to get some money and I'm going to contribute. But when it comes to you, they're not going to do those things. So they don't, they don't really need money. They don't need sex. They can get sex anywhere now. Sex is very uh, uh, pervasive, like in culture and in, in, in society. You don't, you don't even necessarily have to pay for it anymore, right? Folks will give up sex. So they don't really need sex. And then what they uh, what they need is a house. They need a place where they can reside and wonder and do stupid stuff. And um, um, they need the equivalent of a fallback person, right? And so they can have five fallback people, which is called a uh, which is called a dating rotation or just um, uh, polyamorous type situation they just need a house they need a place so the need for a place the homosexual squatter needs a place a house a body a mind to dwell and wonder uh they need a place to sit stir stoop they need a place to spend time and they and the goal is for them is to mimic stability they have never been stable people the homosexual squatter has never the homosexual then the squatter and then a homosexual squatter they have never um exercised any stability beyond um childhood if they if they lived in situations where the parents always moved they were always kicked out they were always homeless they always had to live with somebody or something like that you can't blame them for their childhood and sometimes it takes a good uh fair amount of time to get yourself into an understanding that you are an adult right because if you are leaning on someone even if you had a place of your own and you're leaning on someone to give you 25 dollars for gas money every week meaning that you're not planning your money to plan for the gas money uh shortage you're planning to use somebody else's money for your gas shortage that means you are spending that 25 dollars on something else and you know that you can go back 
and ask that person for that $25. Well, that's that's sort of like squatting on, on somebody's finances. You're like a homosexual squatter on someone else's finances. You plan your life based upon their finances. And it looks like you're stable because you got a place. You just so happen to have a place. And that's usually because the mother or the father won't let you come live with them and you haven't found a woman yet to let you come live with her. So the so then the obvious strategy would be just to go ahead and get your own place. But you're not necessarily the type of person who would keep a place if you didn't have to. There are some people who keep a place because they want to, they need to, they have to. They don't want to live with other people. I'm one of those people. Uh, if uh, the time that I had to go and live with my, uh, with my mother and my shelter, it was the most inconvenient time, but I had to go through that process because I was going through a life correction. I had no other choice. Um, and that's usually because some decisions that you made uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago catch up with you later in life. And so if you didn't save money or you didn't have it as a belief system, when hard times come, you're going to see that that decision um, catch up to you. Um, it catches up to you in a warning, right? And so um, they try to mimic stability. If again, if you can say the same with you, like I said, if you if you even if you have your own place, you can say the same with you. If you're always asking somebody for a portion of your rent, if you never have enough money to pay your car note or if you never have enough money, or you never put away enough money, because you can still have the have the type of job. It may not pay a whole lot, but you can still have it to make your finances, right? But if you are overspending and doing something with your finances, and you know you can go back to your sister, you can go back to your brother, you can go back to your mother or father, you are a squatter uh, on those finances and their finances, and you're trying to mimic stability. The real goal would be to recognize that you are always asking this amount of money from this person every week, just like on a schedule. It just becomes clockwork, like like a schedule. Like it's like you're going instead of going to the ATM to get the money from your bank account, you're going to their. You're treating them like an ATM, okay? You so, so you don't got into that habit and that pattern of doing that. To the point that it's hard to pull yourself out of it because it's convenient. You know you can do it. You know it works. It's a strategy that works. But it can't work long time because that person could die. It can't work long time because that person could lose their job. It can't work long time if it, uh, because that person could get married and the husband says, no, you can't give to your brother like that anymore. Right? He's a grown man. He needs to stand up on his own two feet. You can't keep supporting your daughter like that. She's a grown woman. And, and, and if she got that man in her house, then, then he needs to contribute. He needs to stand, he needs to step up as a man and, uh, and contribute. You can't keep doing it because you are wearing out our finances and trying to help her. So they mimic stability because they, they, they try to give off this image like they are stable people, but they're kind of struggling and can you help them? Okay. Well, how long is that going to last? If you, you got to look at the situation. If the situation is a person where they where they lost everything th uh, through a natural disaster, or or they lost everything through a recession, like the pandemic, people lost jobs during the pandemic. So anyone you help who was affected by like hourly jobs, hourly workers, because you couldn't clock in anywhere, you couldn't go out. People who are salaried, they will still get work. People who are on contracts, like a vendor contract, they still get work. But if you have that situation uh, where people are not generating income and they can't even leave the house, right, because of, 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 of government restrictions, when they when the pandemic is finally um, ended and they they're coming out badly bruised, traumatized, everything like that, helping them is going to take a little bit more time. It's going to take it's not going to take a year. It could take five years to help help that person through that uh, process. They still need to go try to find a job or try to do something to get some income. Uh, keep uh, maintain keep up the house. Like if you're living with somebody, get up and wash the dishes. Uh, 
vacuum the floor. Don't bring people to the house. Do what you got to do until you can get to the next transition in your life. Uh, but with home, uh, with homosexual squatters, they mimic stability as if they are stable. And this could be mental stability. This could be uh, psychological stability, spiritual uh, stability, financial stability. Like if they are 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 religious folks, they try to uh, use the Bible to use the Bible or any other resource to justify their decision making. Um, that is to a de that's to the detriment of you. Because it is true, a man who don't work and don't eat, right? That's vital. And again, you have to take every situation uh, uh, and test what's really going on. Don't be in such a hurry to try to get the person out just because you're inconvenienced. Because er usually the people who are in a hurry to try to get you out are usually the people who've had to go live with somebody. But now that they are up and they're doing well, they don't want to take on the challenge, uh, the inconvenience of helping helping somebody else. And not everyone is a homosexual squatter. People, I'm the kind of person, I'm not a homosexual squatter. I genuinely needed help for a time, and and but I was dealing with people who ironically uh, lost their places, needed help, asked me for money um, when I had it, and I gave it or I gave what I had at that time. And when I needed help, it was an issue. So when you're thinking about the homosexual squatter, really think about what they are presenting to you. A lot of times, let people talk, let them run their mouth. This is scripture too. A fool utters all his mind. They're going to tell off on themselves. It's not going to be long. What happens is we volunteer, we volunteer our place, we volunteer our money, we volunteer our mind, we volunteer our heart, and we raise our hand like we're in a classroom saying, okay, I know the answer. I know the answer. You don't know the answer. They haven't even told you that they actually have a problem. You decided to let the person come live with you because you thought they had a problem. So they don't need, they, they need somewhere. They just need a house. They need somewhere to dwell and wonder, meaning that they, that they're going to wonder aimlessly until you give them aim. And if a lot of times they don't take aim for you from you, they just go on ahead and leave because they have no other uh, choice but to leave. So the homosexual squatter resists the truth. And so this is in 2 Timothy 3, and it goes from 1 till about 8. And I'm going to read it and give you some uh, give you some uh, insight in, uh, into it. So this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So uh, I have heard multiple ministers uh, who are YouTubers um, talk about 2 Timothy 3, and they tend to focus on the idea of uh, verses 5 through 8, mainly. And the when they creep into houses and lead captive uh, silly women, the, uh, with uh, laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, one of the ideas that I thought that they put forth was interesting was that these are women who are looking for an answer to their problem, um, and they're seeking different ways, reading up on materials, asking questions, going to therapy, doing a number of things, right, um, to get to the answer, but they're not finding the answer because 
they are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Something is blocking their understanding or blocking them from re for receiving the understanding. And receiving the understanding really is receiving the truth about the situation. That's why you see uh, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. They resisting the truth about something. Because like I said earlier, if you are a home a person who is homeless 25 years, you are resisting the truth about the situation, about your complicity in the situation. Uh, there was a, um, there's a YouTube channel, Invisible People, I think. And there was an interview that the guy did with some, with a homeless person who had cancer. He had, he, 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 he actually had cancer. And I think it was at the later stages. And I don't know whatever happened to him because when I watched that, I watched it about maybe a year and, and a half ago. And then it came back up on my uh, timeline again. And I watched it, watched it again. I think it was a short this time. And um, and he just kind of resolved to continue to be homeless while having cancer. He doesn't have any insurance. He can't go into a doctor. Um, uh, and, I, and I don't know if he was trying to seek for a place to live or something, uh, but he had cancer. The thing about people sometimes, and there has been a lot of situations where people have gone on camera and they say they don't want to go back in. They don't want to go into the homeless shelter because it's unsafe and unsanitary. Uh, and then they don't like the rules, which is really the truth about the situation. They don't like the rules. But they would rather live out on the streets, in the elements, on the pavement, uh, risk violence, risk violence, risk uh, rape, risk a number of uh, things that could end their life. They would rather do that than to go into a sheltered environment and at least um, at least stay there for a month because if you could and it depends on the shelter some shelters are for a month for 30 days some are for 60 90 days if you get on program you can get on program for six months um, uh, where they let you stay there and you pay some rent right you work a job and you pay pay like a little bit of rent um, and then some programs are long-term programs, 18 months to two years. Okay. And get in there because they have the resources that you need, right? If you get in, uh, and you're bringing in some, some disability money. Okay. Uh, you can stay there six months. It gives you some planning time. You can get your PO box. You can, um, get some mail, to that peel box, you can get stuff started like the uh, food stamps or or um, Medicaid, Medicare, or something like that. You can get a number of things started. You can have access to numbers and agencies and things like that. But the truth of the matter, and this is truth for anyone who is a homosexual squatter or who's in a situation that's too that, that is that has exceeded its life uh, that has exceeded its season. The truth of the matter is you are, you resist the truth about the situation, about who you are as an individual. Um, if you if you are moving from place to place to place, uh, that is you mimicking stability because you think you got a place to live. But you don't have a place, even sleeping on someone's couch is still you homeless. It can be a friend. It could be a family member. Because that is not your place. And at any time, they could decide to say, you got to go. They can, they can pack your stuff and open the doors and you would have to leave. And so when you are thinking about uh, this, this type of person who has a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, this type of person might come off as a religious person may come off and say they're a Christian, may even say that they're a preacher, um, ordained preacher. They may say a number of things, but they have a form of godliness. They don't, un they don't really understand who God truly is because God is also a God who will correct you for your disobedience. They don't see disobedience. They, do they see that I'm a minister and I'm here to help you, but they don't want to do it in line with how God would have have them to do it they just want to and in other words uh a lot of these people who are out here 
calling themselves ministers are not called by God. They just call themselves. They figure they can learn a few things, go take a test, get the ministry license, put on the collar, um, put on the collar, um, try to go get them a church. And the goal for them really is to get the money from the church, the tithes money from the church, the offering, and then preach a message or two. Because when you listen to them, you don't know what they're talking about. You have no idea what they are talking about. They cannot stitch one ideal to the next. They just, it's extremely general, whatever they talk. We got to, like, if they have a Thanksgiving message, like they're called from the main pastor to, to give a Thanksgiving message or something like that. Yeah, they'll stand up there in a pool pit and say, yeah, we got to be more thankful. We got to be more thankful. God is calling us to be more thankful on, on, on this Thanksgiving day. we got to be more thankful. And they'll just keep repeating it. And sometimes they may deviate a little bit, but they'll just keep repeating the same statement over and over and over. They haven't opened up the Bible. They open up the Bible to make you think that they're going to preach from the Bible, but that's just performance. That's just to uh, mimic the idea of what a ministry really is supposed to be doing, which is preaching from the Bible. They're not going to do that. They're going to quote somebody. Oh yeah. I was listening to somebody and they were telling me how uh, I read this book and they were telling me that, that, that people need to be more thankful. And you know what? I agree with that. We really need to be more thankful because I know in my time, we, we didn't have those problems. Our parents, we made, our parents made sure that we were thankful and everything. And so that just keep recycling the same type of statement, doing a deviation of that statement, repurposing it in a little way, but they don't have a message. So then when you have a homosexual squatter in your house who thinks exactly the same way, and they may uh, do this idea where, um, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I have this dream. I really had this dream and I know I can do it. And and I'm just looking for somebody to help me and everything. And But this dream, I just got this dream. I just, but they haven't told you what the dream is. They haven't told you the steps that they have taken to date to accomplish the dream. Um, they're just repeating the same statement. And women get pulled in because women tend to be people who want to help. Women, women are the ones who kind of have a vision about things. Okay, you got a dream. Okay, let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do this or whatever. But when you try to do something with the person to try to help them to achieve their dream, somehow they set back the situation. Uh, they get into a distraction. They call the situation where they go and cheat with somebody else. Or um, they get you mad. They provoke you to anger and things like that. And really what that is, is that they don't have they don't have a true dream. They just push in that idea because they know someone is going to grab onto it. And the goal is to keep the, to be able to stay in a place with you. So if they can keep pushing the dream and pushing the dream of y'all being together and working on the dream and pushing the dream of y'all one day making it, okay, you, they, you attach hope to it and you stay connected to it. And, 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 and essentially it becomes a soul tie. You, you become soul tied because you're still uh, hoping for the hope that they claim that they're hoping for. And so then these are, then you become a silly woman uh, laden with sins because then you're not married. So there is fornication in the uh, mix. So you are still being um, um, uh, sued by the situation in that way. And so then you go out and you sort of almost look like them, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That you don't, you it, it, the there's such a gap in between the ever learning and then and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth that you don't see the situation for what it really is. And what what the truth of the matter is, again, they resist the truth. At the same time, they're liars. The homosexual squatter is a liar. And if you see the truth for what it is that they are liars because they are men of corrupt, they resist the truth and they're men of corrupt minds. They're reprobate concerning the faith. They don't even support the faith that they're calling 
um, them having faith about. I'm ha I just know that I just know this dream is going to come true. You know, I've been working on it and I've been this or whatever. And then you ask them what they've been working on. I don't know. I've just been kind of working on stuff and everything like that. But I know it's going to come true. They don't know that. They don't know that because they haven't put any effort into ensuring that it's going to come come to pass. So, again, look at the situation for what it really is. When you're dealing with anybody, really, not just the homosexual squatter, but when you're dealing with anybody, really listen to what they're not saying. My stepfather told me that. Listen to what someone is not saying. There's not saying something about something. And so um, uh, they're not taking accountability. They're not taking responsibility. They're not uh, asking God for help. They're not asking anybody for help. They're just moving in and they are sort of biding their time to when you figure them out. And they're hoping that you don't figure them out. Sometimes you'll come home and they'll have dinner on the stove, actually have dinner on the stove because they can cook. Sometimes they'll come home and they may bring a flower to you or something like that. And that's when they do that, it's usually because they can sense that you're about to kick them out. You're tired. You're burned out with their lying. OK, and so they don't want to receive the truth. Every time you keep giving them answers and, and, and direction and wisdom, they keep resisting it. You get tired. You get burned out. So the the best way to handle this type of situation is to understand that they resist the truth and they're not, uh, they not, they're really liars and they will keep up the lie as long as they can until they can't. And even then, even when they can't anymore, they still will keep pulling at you and trying to get you to change your mind, uh, which opens the door for them to stay another week, another month, another three months. And by the by you look up one day and they've been staying with you for three years and you didn't even know it time passed by just that quickly what the homosexual squatter hates so the homosexual squatter hates instruction hates wisdom hates responsibility hates accountability hates vision so the instruction again if you're 25 years homeless that means you Bait and instruction somewhere on your journey. You can be homeless one year, two year, three years, four, five, double digit years, and that can still be the uh, truth. That can still be the case that you didn't pay attention to an in instruction. Uh, my situation when I became homeless uh, had a lot to do with uh, two things. One thing I remember when I was working in high school, and uh, and it was the first time that I could buy clothes for myself. And uh, and I would buy clothes, right? And so one day my mother just said uh, to me that if you don't begin saving money, when you graduate, all you're going to do is have a closet full of clothes and no savings. Well, I didn't respect that, that warning, right, that instruction. I, I will say, though, I take full responsibility at the same time, I will say that parents throw out all these types of warnings, but they don't sit down to try to explain to you what it really means. They kind of leave you off to yourself and hope you get it, right? But that's not to sort of, um, you know, disparage my mother or anything like that, because that decision not to begin a savings program, begin sort of understanding what that meant or even asking questions. See, that's my responsibility too. I didn't ask any questions. What do you mean about how to save or something? I wasn't willing to ask questions. So in other words, I really wasn't willing to hear it. I really wasn't he willing to hear that truth. Okay, well, fast forward many years later, uh, that happened when I was in high school, 91, 91 and 93, 11th and 12th grade. And then I moved to San Diego uh, years after that. I went to college, things like that. Uh, and I had trouble still planning my transition from college to uh, the workforce. And then fast forward sometime in 2006, I think, is when um, that warning really became um, truth. It was a warning. It was instruction and that I missed, that I did not regard. And it became a truth right? That 
it became the, the, the brick wall. Now, the reason why I actually became homeless, however, is because of disobedience. So that's the second thing that I, uh, I mentioned. The first is not respecting the instruction. And the second is uh, because of disobedience. So as a Christian, as a born again Christian, we're not supposed to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Meaning that we're not supposed to marry. We're not supposed to go and live with them or something like that. You're going to deal with people who may not believe in God every day on the jobs, things like that. We're not talking about that. So a roommate, I mean, a friend girl uh, from years ago um, offered her room for $275. I was paying about $650 in my place. And she was offering her room for $275. And I'm like, who wouldn't want to pay $275? But she wasn't saved right right and so it would have been an unequally yoked situation and there was multiple uh multiple ironically there was multiple non-saved people trying to warn me about the situation and i just refused to hear the instruction so i moved in and it didn't take uh it was less than three months when she started acting up because um she was the type of person i thought she i thought she needed help or i thought she wanted friendship or i thought she was really offering her room for 275 she didn't need that what she did was she was sort of like a homosexual squatter in my finances i ran my mouth about the type of money that i was getting from school in terms of student loans scholarships things like that i ran my mouth and talked too much and so she realized that she could get a cut of whatever i was doing by offering her room for 275 for her to get back on her feet because she had just exited a relationship and it seems like the relationship with the guy, uh, he probably paid most of the expenses or something like that for the house. And um, uh, so that left her uh, kind of financially down. So she was looking for somebody to kind of um, uh, help her in that way. But she didn't reveal that. She never revealed that. She just revealed that she had a room for rent for 275 and I took the bait. Less than three months, she started acting up. And I'm thinking to myself, why is she acting up like that? Why is what's going on you wanted me to come here you asked for me to come here right i mean i was doing just fine in my own place which tell which should tell me that uh i played my own self and i was i was doing just fine because what i realized she purposed to use me and use my resources and that she did not have any true intent of me staying there it would have been better <laughs> when i think about it lord have mercy when i think about it it would have been better for her to just ask me for a loan than to ask me to come and move with her, act up, and then I turn around and have to move out in less than eight months. I didn't even get a chance to stay there less the full year. I didn't even get a chance to stay there. And so here it is. I go there and I'm thinking that, okay, everything is cool and I can stay here and things like that. And it's not like I needed the place. I didn't need the place I had. I had my little school job. In college, I had the school money. I didn't need the place, but it looked like when I moved into her house that I that I needed a place or something like that. And people start treating you in a such uh, um, in such a way. H had I stayed in that situation longer after she wanted me to leave and made it very clear that she wanted me to leave, then I would have become a homosexual squatter. But I wasn't one initially because I contributed rent. I did what I was I was supposed to do on my end. But homosexual squatter, they it, they hate instruction. Those are two instances where I did not respect instruction, right? I don't call myself a homosexual squatter uh, um, in those two instances. But when I look at um, people who hate instruction, we all could be con considered that. They also hate wisdom. They don't like the fact that you have walked out the steps that they need to take that's wisdom uh, they have already the person who has walked out the steps who is doling out wisdom to you they know how things are supposed to go in a traditional sense you 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 finish high school you go get a job you move out you go get your own place you keep that job you keep that place and you transition from living at your parents house to now becoming an adult and I don't always think you become an adult just because you turn 18. It might take you almost 25 years old to really get a sense of you becoming an adult. However, it takes you to your 40s, late 30s to your 40s to actually understand 
your mortality and that act that actually you've been an adult the whole time from 18 so it's kind of weird they also hate responsibility i don't know if they have a failure complex that if they take responsibility and it fails it's not going to work then i'm i'm a failure or something like that i'm not quite sure but the responsibility and the accountability aspects of this is that they don't want to take on anything in their hands that they can work with, take responsibility for, uh, develop, love, invest in, uh, help somebody with, because when you don't want to take responsibility, you are missing out on the opportunity to help somebody else. That responsibility is transferable or it should be transferable. As soon as you learn how to take responsibility and you build the skill of that, it's going to be easy for you then to talk to somebody else when they come on your path uh, who needs to take responsibility. But if you don't have a history of taking responsibility, it's going to show up in the friendships you have and in, in the relationships you have because you tend to attract who you are and what you are. And if you are the type of person who doesn't take responsibility, uh, doesn't take accountability, you usually are the types of people who are going to get yourself into reckless living, trying to live vicariously or something like that uh, without actually paying bills and not doing what you're supposed to do. And that usually leads uh, in some form or fashion to you committing a crime, which then uh, uh, leads you leads you to going uh, to jail, to prison. Why do you think some people go back and forth, back and forth into prison? what they call recidivism why do you think they keep doing that because it gives them shelter it gives them shelter it gives them a, a place to stay for a minute for uh for temporary reasons it gives them food it gives them air conditioning it gives them a little bit of safety if they can maintain right in that environment because they get out they're all happy about getting out but they never plan their transition to get out they find, they latch on to a woman or a woman latches on to them and they move into the house with the woman. Uh, and then, um, um, and then it goes good. There's like high sex. She's cooking for him. Uh, he's giving it to her. She's giving it to him. And then they wake up and then they realize what the situation really is. And the woman starts saying, Hey, okay, when are you going to find a job? OK, when are you going to do this? And, and a lot of times they be trying to go after some hustle, some hustle, some fast money hustle. A lot of them want to become rappers. A lot of a, a lot of them try to still transition back into um, criminal activity. And then when it gets to a point where where the woman is beginning to realize that it's not going to change, that the person is not really trying to change and they just trying to stay in the same kind of mindset that they were when they went to prison and was in prison and then got out of prison, then uh, it moves to this situation, okay, you got to go. Uh, the problem with that then, it gets to a point where it can also get violent in that situation. And the person is not even willing to sort of take accountability for their own lives, right? As soon as somebody lets you come live with them, that's the time to kind of plan. You should be planning prior to that, but you should definitely use that opportunity to plan. So they ultimately hate vision because vision requires you to see your future right now. See your future in the present. Like I want to become X, right? Or I want to become Z, but I'm in X right now. And so I need to work on X and Y so I can get to Z. They don't like vision because what they want to do is live a very uh, uh, vagabondish life without taking any responsibilities. Like when I was in the shelter, I had to stay at Salvation Army uh, one time for uh, about less than six months. I had to stay in the uh, shelter and uh, somebody told me that the men who were sitting outside of the shelter, kind of like it was hot, and 
what they would do would come in, use the restroom at the Salvation Army and get some water, and then they would go out and sit outside. And then on a Friday, they would go to the liquor store and get them some liquor and drink some liquor laid out on the on the um, on the grass. And someone told me that uh, that a lot of those men got a disability check. And I'm thinking to myself, so you got money, okay? You got money. Why don't you just go on ahead and go get into a place? You can go get into a place. They don't want that. They don't want the vision. They don't want the responsibility, the accountability, and the vision of having a place and staying in that place. They don't want that. I don't understand why you don't want that, but they don't want the responsibility of having to pay rent, pay pay utilities, pay for food. Really, in, 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 in all respects, they don't want the responsibility of paying for responsibility. That's what it really comes down to. And so they will refuse instruction. They will not listen to the person who, who has already experienced the, the situation, which is wisdom. They won't take responsibilities so that they can measure success. They won't hold themselves accountable because they are grown people and they don't want to hear vision about anything. And I don't know if I don't honestly know if someone's heart heart has been broken, like they tried to go after something and it didn't work out. I don't know but they don't like vision. And so, and if they don't like vision, if they hate vision, they lack vision. And so you coming along and trying to help them is not actually going to help them because they don't have a vision of becoming something else. A gaps in understanding for the homosexual squatter. So the homosexual squatter does not know how to do the following, which is pursue emotional self-regulation. Create an opportunity for self-sufficiency. Wean from a primary caregiver. Respect authority. Comply with instruction. Maintain consistency. Sustain stability. So these are the people that will, will eventually blow up on you. Like if you keep trying to get them to see something right and they don't want to see it. And, uh, and all that basically is, is that they just don't want to see it. They don't care. They don't care how you try to outline it for them, put it in a video lesson, write it on a whiteboard, give them some uh, some index cards, write down an outline, write a whole essay on the cockamamie thing. They don't care. And so a lot of them have, I think, spirits on them that create uh, a very toxic situation, very violent situation that they're going to blow up. And so a lot of times they blow up and the goal is still not to blow up for you to kick them out. The goal is for them to not be homeless. So they look at blowing up as a way to capture you. Because remember, this is about territorial dominance. So they look at a way about capturing you and distracting you at the same time. Because if you're mad at each other, you both go to your separate corners and then you mad in a room, he's mad in a room. Uh, uh, you're cussing, he cussing, he's cussing, and you're doing another thing. And then some hours pass by, and one of you comes out of the room, and then the, and then the other person hears the other person coming out of the room. He, uh, he comes out of the room, and you kind of look at each other, and then uh, and then you kind of go in silence, right? You're still in silence, and he's playing video games, and then you go back and you watch TV, and then by the end of the night or or the morning, you've already had sex again. You've already had sex again. There's no way around. You've already had sex again. And so that's the goal. So there will be times when the person will self-regulate purposely, not because they have great emotional self-regulation. Because if you had great emotional self-regulation, you would have your own job and have your own place. The fact that they, they, they have to live with you and they don't have a job and don't have a place tells you right there that they don't have good emotional self-regulation because they can't stay on a job or they refuse to stay on a job. And it can be a situation where the job is a good job. I had an ex who got good jobs. He got good job, jobs I could not get. And I have a degree. I have two degrees and he, and he got good jobs with good brand name companies, things like that. I couldn't even get those jobs. He would get on those jobs and go good, maybe for the probation period, I guess. And then somewhere he would start acting up with the supervisor. 
He would start acting up with the people around him. He would just have this real uh, mean, silly, honorary attitude just out of nowhere. It didn't even make any sense for him to have that attitude. And so what that suggested to me when I began to look at the pattern of what he was doing was he was trying to get fired. So then what he would do would uh, he would um, create a situation where he's having a problem with the supervisor. Then he has to go to HR and talk about it with HR. And he would write these long letters to HR and then um, come out of HR. And then he has to return to work. And then uh, in one situation, he created the circumstances for him to have an uh, accident, an accident on the job. So then that prolongs his stay there, even though he don't want to stay there. He's becoming almost like a homosexual squatter, even on the job. And uh, and so then he would go to the hospital and, um, you know, get it on record that he has a, uh, an issue due to an accident. So then, you know, jobs can't really force you to quit too much after that. He may have to do some workman's comp or something like that. And so then he really... Eventually, he will uh, create the situation where he no longer has a job. And this will go on. And I didn't realize what he was doing because when the homosexual squatter comes and talks to you about these things, I'm telling you, they sound so sincere. They sound like people are really doing them wrong and that, that you got to take up the mantle to fight for some justice situation for them. And, and and we got to go out there and march and help him because because the supervisor is doing him wrong. And and if the supervisor would just leave him alone, he would he could do his job. The problem is he never intended to do the job. He never intended to stay on the job. He never intended to do the job. Well, my situation, he was a homosexual uh, squatter, uh, homosexual in my uh, house that I permitted. And uh, and he didn't necessarily turn into a squatter because I went on ahead and let go of the situation. It took two years and eight months, but I went on ahead and let it go. And in some ways, he wasn't uh, like a vagabond and um, emotional squatter. But for legal purposes, um, I went on ahead and let him go. What happened with him, the only reason why that he would go get a job was because he was trying to improve. He was trying to impress the ex who wouldn't let him know where she lived. So she kicked him out of his place. They broke up or semi broke up. I come on the scene. I thought he, I think he's not with someone. Uh, and then she finds out about us later. And so she starts to mess with the relationship. And, um, and so she gives him, him demands that I don't know about. And it's not until I reflected on the situation, realizing that, okay, he would get the job and then he would lose it on purpose. He would get the job and lose it on purpose, get the job and lose it on purpose. And I said, why is he doing that? Because I realized later that he was only getting the job just to uh, show her, okay, I'm really doing something with my life. Look, I got the job. I'm on this job. Okay. Then she'll tell him to stay on the job and things like that. Probably give him probably give her some money that he wasn't giving me. And um, 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 and that situation went on for a while until I realized what was going on, that they were both playing me. Once I realized that they were both playing me, because I played myself into believing, I played myself in believing that I could help somebody who 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 I thought needed help. That's how I played myself. Then I then he played me. And uh, and uh, selling me this idea that that he really wanted to be with me, that it's all about me and we're, and we're working together. And then she played him in a sense that if you do all these different things, OK, I'll take you back. But in reality, they were both playing me. They were both playing me because she never intended to take him back because she never uh, told him where she lived. And he never intended to stay with me because he was always still so tied to her. And he had always planned to go and live with her, even though she never told him where he lived or where she lived. So they don't know how to pr pursue emotional self-regulation. Emotional self-regulation in that situation would have been for him to realize that she's playing games and that he needs to make a decision about her being a Jezebel in his life. 
the emotional self-regulation for me was the was the decision that I eventually made in kicking him out for good. I never let him come back. And it's been, what, five or six years now? I never let him come back. And so that was the emotional self-regulation for me. They know they they don't know how to create an opportunity for self-sufficiency, meaning that they don't, here it is, there's an opportunity for self-sufficiency. The fact that you are an adult, you know that you are an adult, it's time to go get a job, stay on a job, keep it, then use it to get the place. They won't take any job. Okay, sometimes, say for instance, you, 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 you give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay, you're like 30 years old, uh, 40 years old, and you don't want to go work work for McDonald's, right? And it could be a number of reasons. Maybe it could be embarrassment. Maybe it could be, it'll be too much on your body uh, because you are much, much older. Okay, then go get a job in a warehouse. Go get a job at Walmart. Go get a job at a at another type of place, but go get a job. Like I said, he would go get a job, but he would never keep it on purpose. So that means he's not creating an opportunity for self-sufficiency because he's moving from job to job. And you usually need to stay on a job for at least a minimum of two years. And then you reassess with that job if you want to stay there for the next uh, three years to total five. But if you're moving from place to place and it's not a temporary staffing uh, type situation, you're not self-sufficient. You get a little money here, okay, and then that gives you a little bit of uh, uh, um, option to go buy some things that you want to do. In other words, you're still acting like a kid, like you're still living in your parents' house. You're still living in your parents' house, giving your mother or father a little bit of money, right, towards something, and then you go and spend all the rest, okay, while you are an adult doing that, okay? So at some time, at some point in your life, you're going to have to force yourself into accepting an opportunity for self-sufficiency. So that means if you had to go live with somebody because of a situation, that is an opportunity for self-sufficiency. You're still homeless in the situation. Do keep that in mind. You're still homeless in a situation because it's not your place. You're not on the lease. You're not on the mortgage. You're not on the deed. But it's an opportunity for self-sufficiency. Sit that person down. Let's talk. Okay, here's the situation. Can I give you $300? I can save for a place. If I give you too much, it'll be hard for me to save for a place at least. And, and if the goal is for me to leave, okay, and get my own place, then can I give you this, $250, $300, and then I can uh, work and probably get what I need to get and save money uh, for about six months, six to eight months, maybe six to nine. Would you be willing to work for me? And I can contribute few food. Okay, now you are creating an opportunity for self-sufficiency. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some transition time. It's going to take a process, but you are creating the opportunity. What happens is, though, they they struggle to wean from a primary caregiver. So the primary caregiver in their in their childhood uh, uh, life uh, was a mother or father or an aunt or a big mama or um, if they were adopted or something like that or uh, could have been a family member, like if their parents died and the sister or brother took up the mantle to uh, try to raise all the kids. Okay, that's a primary caregiver. What happens with homosexual squatters, though, they try to treat the woman that they're with as almost a primary caregiver, really actually as a primary caregiver, because the woman already initiates all those types of qualities of primary caregiving. She becomes a mother without realizing that she's becoming a mother in the situation. And men will say, well, she's operating in her masculine, trying to take over the role of a man. Well, the man is not doing anything. The man is not doing it. He's not getting a job. He's not keeping a job. He's not doing anything. So then, like most women, we're going to do whatever we got to do to get the situation uh, handled, to, to get the job done. But the problem with that is, is that you, you have changed your role from romantic partner to now primary caregiver. Because if he doesn't have a job, he, he can't get his own place. If he can't get his own place, then he's living with you. If he's living with you, he's basically homeless. Because like I said, at any time you could decide to kick him out. Women usually don't kick them out, though. It usually takes us. It took me two years and eight months to kick, kick him out. Because a lot of times we feel bad for the situation. We don't want them out there by themselves. 
Uh, we don't want them uh, hurt, harm, harm and in danger. They could run into somebody. Of course, we don't want them with somebody else, like another girl or something like that. But all those qualities are parenting qualities, not romantic relationship building qualities. So if they have already uh, been struggling with weaning from a primary caregiver who was actually a blood relate, related primary caregiver and to now transitioning to you, it's hard to get them out of that mindset. It's hard to get them out of that mindset. They want to be in that mindset. They want to be coddled. It's like the movie Baby Boy. They want to be in the womb. And they want to be able to take from the womb. They want to be able to take resources or whatever. When you think about the situation uh, with the male uh, character, he just moved from women to women. When one didn't work out and, and, and he put a child in her, and then they ended up having a child too, um, um, he just moved to the other woman who he had a child with, who he lived with, right? And then when that didn't work, he moved to another woman. He just moved. He was a homosexual squatter. He just moved from person to person, person to person, because he was looking for the primary caregiver. The mother uh, likely had him young, so she didn't have the uh, maternal uh, faculty. So then their grandmother, her mother, which was... Um, or, or big mama, she took care of him while the daughter was still in the house or while the daughter was running around or, 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 or something like that, right? So that's who he got used to. So he's just moving from his mama to the uh, baby mamas to anybody else who will be a primary caregiver. So then you would think that if they can't wean from a primary caregiver that they would respect authority and instruction. No. Uh, a, a lot of times they they have a problem with the ideal of the caregiver giving to them. Men really don't like you helping them. That doesn't mean they won't take the help, but they really don't like you helping them. Uh, pay attention to people who come up as celebrities, especially men. Um, a lot of times what they'll do is that they'll let that wife who they're coming up with help them help them get their dream off the uh, um, um, on track, things like that. But when they finally make it, they drop that woman. And they marry a woman who did nothing for them. Look at any situation, celebrity, billionaire, businessman, any situation. They always marry the woman who did nothing for them. And so for a long time, then you have to wonder, were they a homosexual squatter? In that marriage, in the marriage, they were married. They both had a place. They both were helping him work towards his dream and work uh, uh, and everything. But as soon as he made it and he got money, he went on ahead and left. And so they don't respect authority, meaning in this situation, the marriage would be the authority. The marriage should be good just uh, when, it's, uh, when we don't have a lot of money and when we do have a lot of money. Why are you now exiting the marriage just because you have a lot of money? Okay. They don't comply with instruction. Like the situation I told you, he always created a situation where he had to get fired. And the instructions can be very clear. Go work on this, this side of the, of, of, of the department. Go meet that need or go, go do this, go do this report or whatever. And they don't want to comply with instruction because when you comply with the instruction, you actually advance. If you think about the platoon leader, when the platoon leader says forward march, if you stay in place, you are going to become stagnant after a while. You are, are disrespecting instruction. But when you, when he says forward march and you march, just by visual alone, you are advancing one foot in front of the other. But they don't want to comply with instruction because they don't want to put one foot in front of the other. Because if they advance, then they would have to take responsibility. Then they have to be accountable. Then they have to accept the truth about themselves, that they are grown people. They can't lie to anybody anymore. And people like their conveniences. They would rather, rather not take responsibility, not take accountability, resist the truth and lie to themselves. So then it's hard for them to maintain consistency and to sustain stability because 
sustain maintaining consistency and stay and sustaining stability uh keeps you on a a very uh narrow path broad narrow is the way broad people like to go the broad way that's why they like to do all these twists and turns they go and uh sell their houses to go in rv here it is they are 60 70 years old when they should be in retirement and they would rather go and and roam the countryside because they wanted to do that when they were in their 20s but then they realized when they get to 75 that they shouldn't have done that that they were already in a stable situation and you didn't necessarily have to sell your house you could just go on vacation you can go on vacation so now they're going to end up having to become homosexual and homosexual squatters in their family lives right or they may have to live in their rv at an rv park or something like that so they don't know how to sustain stability now if they've all if they had multiple opportunities to uh create uh self-sufficiency and they refuse it's going to be hard for them to sustain stability or listen to you about sustaining stability because they don't respect it so in other words not only do they not respect authority they don't respect emotional self-regulation they don't respect self-sufficiency they don't respect the primary caregiver they don't respect instruction consistency stability so if they don't have respect for it and honor for it nothing that you say is going to help them to understand how important it is how are you affected by the homosexual squatter so you are affected by the homosexual squatter in the following ways so you get off track emotionally psychologically spiritually and financially you refuse to see the homosexual squatter as an individual who does not want to change and does not want change you have a distorted vision of yourself as a resource center a shelter or a central place for refuge and help you exercise pride and some arrogance in believing you are the person's answer to their homeless problem you answer their homeless problem before you understand their problem and who he or she is as a homosexual squatter you believe you can fix the person love the person for a long time believe that the person would change and hold out hope you become a homosexual squatter because you have you have invested too long and contributed to the ruin of your finances you become that person so um kind of working backwards for a minute you you again you attract what and who you are and so if you spend too much time there's a scripture in the bible uh evil communication corrupts corrupts good manners so the longer you stay with a, a person who is non-productive who gets into stuff who uh supports violence who does everything but live a stable life you're going to become that person eventually because evil communication corrupts good manners you're going to start adopting their belief system because eventually that's what they're showing you which, which is a belief system their belief system is that it is better to be a homosexual squatter than it is to be a stable person essentially so that's why you get off track you get off trap uh, trap emotionally because you pull yourself into a situation thinking that you can solve the problem you you sustain yourself in that situation psychologically because you think you have all the answers you disobey god spiritually because you you become god in their life and you mess up your finances investing into a bottomless pit they are a bottomless pit they do not want change they do not want to change and they uh and does not want change change is sitting right there in front of them this is the way to go internally intuitively um um instinctually this is the way to go how is it that the animal the non-human animal knows better how to direct its life better than a human animals know uh if you look at the safari or any of of the the national geographic um channels i mean channel with the little documentaries even a certain uh herd of animals know not to go a certain way because they know they're going to run into a predator they know they're going to run into a predator so they know not to go that way okay how is it that the animal understands that better than the human when you look at the baby like the babies the the uh the pups 
uh, the ones who are, are just born from a lion or elephant or, or something like that, you can understand them going and wandering off because they're a baby and they're sort of like exploring and they don't understand the dangers of that. And that's why you'll see the parent animal, go, the, the, the mother animal especially, will go after that lion cub, right, to get that uh, lion cub back on track. Okay, well, when you think about it, homosexual squatters are the same as that lion cub. Not understanding the dangers of of moving about the way that they are moving about they may understand that if i sit on this corner i'm going to get an issue i'm going to have an issue with somebody but they don't understand the homelessness of of the implications of the homelessness of of their decision making that there's consequences there have been many reports lately of people fighting with homeless people hitting them, kicking them, shooting them in the back of the head. And a lot of times you understand that you're homeless and that there, uh, that there are some consequences to being homeless. You're sleeping out on, uh, uh, you sleep on the ground. You have a tent, things like that. Okay. It's hard. You can't get enough sleep because sleep you never get enough rest, things like that. Okay. You get that. But you don't understand the full consequences of, of that decision that, People will look up, look on you, look upon you host, with hostility, so that they can actually harm you. Because you would think that I'm homeless. You should have some compassion for me, some empathy for me. Why are you beating me up? But that's exactly what they want to do. And so you waited too long to change, and you are waiting too long to not accept change. I heard. I'm telling you. I saw a news report of this woman almost bragging that she didn't want to go into the shelter because she didn't feel that uh, it was safe. She kind of slipped that in, but she really got to the point that she really wanted to make. I don't like the rules. Okay, so that means you don't want change because the rules represent instruction. It's going to move you forward. And and if you don't like change and you don't want to change, so so you're basically saying you want to die homeless that's the life vision that you have for yourself that you want to die homeless same thing with the homosexual squatter um if you continue to let the homosexual uh, homosexual squatter stay in your house because um uh, uh someone is going to die in this situation the overworked person is always the person who will die unless you get that person out you're gonna have a heart attack it's, it's you're gonna have a stroke you're going to have a heart attack because you're not taking care of yourself. You're not minding yourself. You are so busy minding that person and keeping up with that person. You can't sleep at night. You go. Uh, uh, you can't have any rest because you know you're not supposed to be in that situation that you don't want to change it. And so if, if the homosexual squatter does not want to change, that means that you don't want to change in a situation if you still keep the homosexual squatter in your house. You don't want, you don't want to change and you don't want the situation to change. And it's either going to, it's, it's either you're going to come to a crossroad moment and say, I can't do this anymore. I'm too old for this game. I'm done with this. I got to move on with my life. I got to let him go. Or you're going to continue to let that person stay in your house, uh, ruin your finances, ruin your psychology, ruin your mental, emotional, and spiritually to the point that you become, you become a shell of yourself. You uh, have mental issues because they are coming. Because it's something on that homosexual squatter that is mentally unstable and is going to transfer to you if you continue to stay in the situation. That's why, that's how we get the distorted vision of ourselves being a resource center, a shelter, a central place for refuge. You are not a rehabilitation center. You're not a resource center. There are resource centers where people are on the clock and they get paid to tell you about resources. Send that person to the resource center. I had to learn this the hard way, not because of, of, um, of a romantic situation, but um, when I was in college and dealing with friends. And these are friends who had cars and I was riding the bus or the train. And so I would talk to them about something that I heard or something like that or whatever. 
and um and sometimes if you're already in that situation like in that office you can pick up a handout or something like that okay no problem but if you're not and it takes you having to drive in your car then um you're not going to be able to easily do that because you have to get off the bus to get off right to go get this uh thing for the person well my situation was i always volunteered my time i didn't set boundaries with myself uh, so when i ran off at the mouth about opportunities or whatever the first thing they would say uh was oh, okay can you stop by and get that for me okay again remind you they had cars and like a dummy um um i actually did it but then i realized the truth of the matter was oh they got cars why am i getting off the bus to go get something when they can get in their car and go get the situation themselves so then what i started to do was i stopped doing that for one and then I gave them the address because I knew the address, right? I gave them the address. I gave them a phone number. Um, uh, I told them that there's a resource in it. And I told them the days and times that they're open, things like that. Oh, but you can't go over there. I mean, I'm, I mean, you live over there. No, I can't go over there anymore. It's not on my uh, route. So you would have to go over there. Uh, just take some time. It's open on Fridays. You don't have to go uh, to school or work on Fridays. And they hate when they realize you see them for who they are they really do hate that because now you're telling them the uh, truth about themselves without even having to tell them the truth about themselves you are off on friday get your big head up and go over there yourself so therefore therefore when i say this even if we were not talking about the homosexual squatter just in general you are not a resource center you are not a shelter you are not a central place for refuge and help they can get up if they if people really wanted the thing that they claim that they wanted they will get up and get it themselves they don't need you they don't need you to tell them that now sometimes people don't always know certain things and 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 if you're privy to it don't withhold good from them to the uh don't withhold good uh uh from them to whom it is due right if you have knowledge of a something don't hoard knowledge okay at the same time don't get up and walk and get on a bus stop and go to a place where they can go to in their car. And um, and so when you're taking in these homosexuals, and especially if you don't learn from the previous situation, you're, gonna, you're doomed to repeat anew, don't move people in. Don't move that partner in, that romantic partner in. If you have to move in someone, that tells you right there, they can't take care of themselves. If they can't take care of themselves, that means they can't take care of you. If you got sick, if you got sick, not that you need someone to take care of you because you got a job, you have your place or whatever. After after uh, after all, they're moving in with you. But what if you got sick? They're not going to stay to help you. And if they do stay, if if by chance they do stay to help you, it's because they are after something. It's something that they're after. Because remember, they still haven't gotten a job. They still haven't contributed anything. They still haven't done anything. But you being sick in the bed, still gives them a place to live and so then they'll help you in that way but i wouldn't trust it okay then you exercise pride and some arrogance in believing you are the person's answer to their homeless problem you answer their homeless problem before you understand their problem meaning that you 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 it's the person in the uh, classroom let me volunteer and give this answer here is the teacher asks uh who wants to go and then you raise your hand up so fast or if someone has a problem in their life, you raise your hand up so fast. Or if if there's a situation with someone, you raise your hand up uh, uh, so fast. You don't actually listen to them. See, I had this problem when I was working uh, with the call center. And um, there was this girl. She kind of positioned herself around me. And, and, and it made me uncomfortable and um she would look me up and down and her eyes you know her glaze just really made me uncomfortable one day she asked me for money she asked me for i don't know 40 50 dollars or something like that and uh and i'm thinking to myself wait we work for the same company we know what each other uh how much each other makes so you ask me for money and like a dummy, I still gave it to her because I was I was like 19, almost 20 or something like that. So I was still in, in my naivete. But I was naive for a good while, though, before I started to 
realize how people play you. So she asked me for money. So I gave it, gave it to her. She said she'll pay it back. Um, and so the next day or next, whatever her next work day was, she comes in with her hair fixed, with a new outfit, and some new kicks, right, some new shoes. I'm thinking to myself, so how did you get the money to buy those things if you needed money from me? And of course, I started to understand the situation for what it really was. She wanted to use my money to fund her lifestyle. That's exactly, that's the truth of the situation. Okay, truth of the, the other truth of the situation, I should not have given somebody who works, uh, I should not have given somebody money who also has a job. She has a job and she likely had um, uh, family members, right? Because she just kind of looked like that kind of person who would have a big family. So I didn't, um, I, I didn't understand her problem that she was trying to present as a problem. All she asked was, all she asked for was $40, $50, right? She didn't tell me the reason why. I didn't ask for the reason why I should have, right? And maybe, and maybe she was hoping that I wouldn't ask, but I think she had actually purpose to use me. That's why she positioned herself. She sat on the other side of the call center, but then all of a sudden she started wanting to sit by me. And uh, uh, it's, it's the way people read you to see how they could use you. And they'll throw the first dart. The first dart is always either, can you take me home in your car? Or can you, um, can you take me home? Or can you give me money? Right? And then if you're riding in a car with them, oh, can, um, uh, and, and they take you home. Okay, now they know where you live. And then the first thing they're going to ask, oh, can I use the restroom? I, girl, I, I waited too long, right? Can I use the restroom? Then they, then you open the door and let them in to use the restroom, right? They don't need to use the restroom. And a lot of times they're not too far from their own home. Um, and so what they do is once they use the restroom or pretend to use the restroom, then they'll come out and say, oh, girl, you got a nice house. Oh, right. Because they're trying to figure out who lives with you, what's going on with you. They're trying to figure out anything about you. So they can talk about it, uh, talk about it on the job, but they can also uh, think to themselves if you may be available for them if something happens, right? And so um, um, they do that, and then it becomes a habit that they take you, oh, no, I take you home, I do this or whatever, oh, it's okay, it's on my way, I got to go to the store in, in, in that area anyway, but they are really grooming you, that's a good one, they're really grooming you, they're grooming you to continue to use you, they use you in the first way, and now they have to stretch it out, so then they become homosexual squatters in your life, eventually, something is going to happen, where they're going to have to uh, come and live with you. Because the first thing they're going to ask you when they are surveying your place is, oh, 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 you live by yourself? Oh, you live by yourself? Oh, who lives with you? And they will actually walk to the room to see if someone lives there because they are grooming you to use you. That's what they're really after. And so uh, when you give money, when you put something on something that you don't have an understanding about, uh, what it is they actually uh, have an issue with, that's how that uh, happens, that they, uh, you are answering a problem before you fully understand that they either have a problem or don't have a problem. You believe you can fix the person, love the person for a long time, believe that the person will change and hold out hope. And so that right there is usually a romantic situation. That's why we stay in those situations a lot longer. It's interesting that men don't go and live with men. That friend guys, uh, homeboys, all, all that kind of stuff, they never go live with uh, them. They always find a woman that they can go live with because they know that they don't have to be responsible. They know that they don't have that man's breath, breath on their neck to hurry up and make decisions and things like that. They know that they can stretch out their homosexual behavior with the woman. But now you see a lot of situations where uh, men who are, are dating each other and one of them needs to go and live with the partner, now you're seeing that that is homosexual, that they, that they are now moving in with their romantic partner and not doing anything. And so you see videos, video, um, 
I forget what the name is, but, but it's a comedy situation, right? Where, where the partner is now moving out that man. The male partner is now moving out that man because, because he was taking the situation uh, too far and that he didn't really intend on letting him live there. So you can't fix that person. That person has, to, that's something that has to come from within. That's something that has to come from within. And the longer you try to do that, you're going to mess up whatever you got going on with your life. And it's going to get you off track. That's why you see a lot of people who end up dying a tragedy because they are they are in places where, they, where they're not supposed to be. That's how you die a tragedy. You can die a tragedy by being out of order, being somewhere you're not supposed to be too soon, or you are in a place where you're not supposed to be at all. That's why I resist the temptation to always go to house parties. Resist the temptation to always go and hang out with friends on trips and things like that. People are ending up dying from going on uh, 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 trips with friends. They're supposed to be your friends, but somehow um, you are ending up dead. It doesn't make any sense. And so they presented themselves to you much longer in... Um, being a person who always asks you for something and then you probably funded the trip, they're resentful and offended by that and they try to provoke you to anger in that situation and then you end up dead or in jail or something. And so you can't fix that person. Love the person for a long time. Believe that the person will change and hold out hope. Your hope is going to die. And if you don't get yourself out of that situation, you're going to die. So you become a homosexual squatter because you have invested too long uh, and contributed to the ruin of your own finances. The, uh, you become that person, meaning that you put so much money into that person that you now find yourself homeless. You've been blinded by trying to hold out hope and change for that person that you have not been uh, doing something over here in the financial realm to the point that you have become homeless. You have now become that person because then you're going to have to go live with somebody. Either you're going to go back to the shelter, you're going to go to the shelter, or are you going to go and live with somebody? So this is how you are affected by the homosexual, uh, homosexual squatter. So this leads us to this ideal about be careful about answering matters. Uh, be careful about answering matters before you understand them. Uh, Proverbs 18, 13, he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So that means that it's going, it's, it's going to end up in shame. Because anyone who knows you in a relationship is going to find out uh, how it turned out. Uh, and, and it's usually they left you, they got with somebody else. You, they managed to put a baby in you, right? And so then that, that continues or that extends their territorial dominance. So now they can pull at you anytime they want. They can claim... Um, you keeping me from my child, right? They can even try to take you to child support. Now men, men are getting child support, especially if the woman makes a lot of money, men are getting child support. So they can create a situation, provoke the situation where you get mad because you're already mad that they decided to go on ahead and leave you. You couldn't put them out. What happened was in that situation, the person who, who uh, uh, wasn't coming around either came around or they found a new hustle. They found another person that they can move in with and then they can lie to that person about you and that you're the one who's causing all these problems and keeping him from the child and, and things like that. And then they'll push this idea about child support or whatever. So they have to provoke you in order to, uh, to get custody so then they can get child support. So it's a game. It's a whole hustle. So be careful not to answer a homeless matter. Because this is actually a homeless matter. That's the truth of the situation. The homosexual squatter is homeless. And their goal is to not be homeless. And they're going to do whatever they got to do to not be homeless. And so be careful not to answer a homeless matter. That means you have to address it as a homeless matter. And or a homosexual squatter's matter before you understand the person's problem. Be sure that the person classifies what you believe is a problem as a problem. If the person does not see their homelessness as a problem, then it is not a problem for the person. Just because you call attention to it as a problem doesn't mean that they see it as a problem. Uh, you can go back um, how they are affected by homelessness is that they have a distorted vision. 
Because as long as they can go find a spot, pitch a tent, as long as they can go go into the shelter, get some water and use the restroom, as long as they can maybe sometimes sleep in the airport, um, uh, sleep on a bench, right? As long as they can go find a place in the woods, no one knows that they're there and will mess with them or anything like that, no animals or anything like that. As long as they can do that, as long as they can get some disability money, as long as uh, they can um, get a few dollars, sometimes they can go to their brother's house and take a shower and things like that. As long as they can have little conveniences uh, along the way, they're not going to change the situation. So then they don't see it as a, a a problem for change. They don't see it as a problem for change or to change. They don't see it as a problem. So therefore, we need to stop calling problems uh, what's going on in someone's life. And this is just generally. We need to stop calling problems that people don't see as problems. The prostitute that you see on the street, and this is not to talk against prostitutes, but the prostitutes that you see on the street when you know you got uh, places th th that you can get a job now. Many people are, are abandoning their jobs or quitting their jobs, and so that means it's opening up jobs. And it can be anything from Walmart to, to, to McDonald's, Starbucks, anything. You know you can get a job. Jobs are available now. But you, you would rather prostitute. You would rather walk out there in hardly any clothing in the cold weather. In the cold weather, okay? And cold is cold everywhere now. You would rather do that than to go get a job, even temporarily somewhere, uh, you know, so you can get your life together. You would rather do that. Then that means you don't call what you're doing right there a problem. It's not a problem for you. That's why when we walk by and pass judgment and look at the person and, and shake our heads, I don't know why we're doing that. We need to stop doing that. Sure, can we pray for somebody? Absolutely. Can we have some uh, sympathy and empathy for somebody just, just from a distance that somebody feels like they have, that they need to do that actual thing that they're doing? Sure, we can do that. But we also need to look at the truth of the situation. We also need to look at what they're showing us. It, it goes back to Maya Angelou's uh, uh, quote. If a person shows you who they are, believe them. We need to stop saying that they have a problem if they don't call what they have as a problem. They don't label it as a problem. The drug dealer, the drug dealer or the drug addict, until that person confesses that taking this drug it's bad for me and I got to stop until they do that. It's not a problem for them. It works for them. They manage to panhandle, get about $20, go to the drug dealer, get some drugs, do a hit. And that's their productivity for the day. It worked. The goal was to get some money to get some drugs. It worked until that goal uh, is challenged to get some money to get, Drugs, you saying you 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 saying to them you getting money to get drugs is wrong is not going to resonate with them, is not going to penetrate. They don't care. They manage to to set a goal, endure a goal, and complete a goal. That's goal. Now that's setting, enduring, and completing a wrong kind of goal, but it was a goal nonetheless. So if the homosexual sets the goal to find somebody to live with so he is not homeless. And he found someone, played a game, played the emotional mental game, and managed to live in the person's uh, uh, house by permission and stay there for a long time by permission, then it worked. It's not a problem for him. Not contributing anything, not getting on the job order. Is permitted. She permits him not to work. Even though she doesn't say, hey, I'm permitting you not to work. She's not saying it. But through her actions or inactions and no challenge to, to this adult living in her house, she's permitting it. She's allowing it. Maybe that word allow is a better word. 
because she's allowing him to stay in her house without working, without uh, uh, paying anything, without contributing, giving sex. So basically, at the end of the day, she's paying for sex. She's paying for sex because she's and, and at the end of the day, he's prostituting so he can have a place to live. So we're both really the twos. We're prostituting in this situation. I need somebody in the house for sex. He needs somewhere to live. I pay him, right? And he can give me sex. Of course, that's not going to last long because uh, those types of situations end up affecting you mentally. You never fare well when you are in those situations and you struggle when you're out of it because then you get addicted to the situation. You get addicted to the patterns and the lies and the irresponsibilities and the instability and the toxic nature of the situation that is hard to separate yourself, meaning that you get addicted just like a, like a drug addict. And so when he goes through his withdrawals, you go through your same type of withdrawal. But you got to make a decision. Everybody got a crossroad moment. And before tragedy hits you, you have always had some form of warning in your life. You just decided to ignore it. So be careful. Again, be careful not to answer a homeless matter. Actually address it as a homeless matter. Be careful not to answer a homeless matter and or a homosexual squatters matter before you understand the person's problem. Be sure that the person classifies what you believe is a problem as a problem. If the person does not see their homelessness as a problem, then it is not a problem for the person. So then you have to make a decision that if they don't see it as a problem and you see it as a problem, there is a disconnect. There is disharmony. Uh, Amos 3 and uh, 3, can two walk together unless they agree? If you are not in agreement with what you believe to be a problem for him, then it's time to create an exit plan. You're either going to stay in that situation and he's going to continue to pull at you and your resources, or you're going to exit that situation and you're going to cut him off from uh, you and your resources, and you got to be consistent with it. What the homosexual uh, squatter must do, the homosexual squatter must do the following. So get and keep a job. Keep that job for more than a year. Get and keep a place. Pay for that place on their own and without help and with uh, with their own money he or she gets from working on a job legally. Stay in that place for a minimum of a year and then recess. Reassess. What I remember my stepfather uh, saying, and this was be, uh, this was after I made many of my bad decisions, right, concerning homosexual uh, uh, men, was that uh, he made this comment, um, and I didn't get the the understanding of it until much later. What he said was, when you're dating with someone, seeing someone, pay attention, again, pay attention to what they're not saying. Okay, that's one. And then he said, um, Tim, um, does he have a job? Okay. And then ask him how long he's been on a job. Okay. Then ask him how, does he have a place? All right. So then how long has he been in that place? OK, so then if he has been in that place for a long time, does he have any furniture? All right. And then now you can look at the situation uh, for what he is. He's a grown up. He understands that he's a grown up. He got a job. He got a place. Uh, there is intent to be stable because he got furniture. And so now he can date responsibly. Okay. But if you have someone, depending upon the situation, if you have a male who is living with their parents, it may be a situation where the parents are sick or elderly or something like that. That may be different. Okay, If the male is contributing to the house because there isn't much income coming into the house because the parents are retired, that's a little different. Yeah, you may have to have to, um, you know, kind of look at that situation. All right. Uh, and just assess it for what it is. Okay. But if he's 40 years old and those issues are not present, meaning that the parents are well able, they got money of their own, they got own, uh, their house is paid for, and he's just living there and barely paying any money, he don't know how to take care of himself. 
in, in other words, he can't wean. He doesn't know how to wean himself from the primary caregiving of that house, the parents, their money, their uh, anything that they're offering him. He doesn't know how to do that. Okay, if he doesn't know how to do that, he can't be a husband to anybody, let alone a boyfriend. He can't. He can't function apart from. Um, he can't function apart from the breast. He's still weaning from his mother's breast. He still wants his father's hug around him, right? Um, and that's a problem because when you come together as two adults who want to get married, both of you need to keep a job. I don't agree uh, today in today's climate um, financial climate, social climate, political climate, that people that people in a marriage or at least one person should not have a job. If there's a situation where they just had a baby and uh, the mother needs to be at home right for five years, that's different, okay? But eventually you need to get a job because if you put all of the responsibility, uh, lay all of the responsibility and burden on the man, on the husband, to do everything in this climate today, what if he gets sick? What if he has a stroke? What if he um, uh, has a heart attack? What if he decides to leave you? He could decide to leave you. That could happen. And so I don't think anybody should be without a job. Even a stay at home mom, um, mother or father should have at least a job with somewhere for two days. Because it gives you some change in your pocket. It gives you some income. And so if a person decided to leave you, you could tell their job, hey, I'm available for full time or more hours. Can you give me more hours? Then it's easier to transition into that situation. But if you don't have anything at all, that's going to prove kind of detrimental to you because you are relying too much on uh, one person when you are still an adult. See, I don't base everything simply on, okay, he needs to make X amount of money. He needs to do this. He needs to do that. I don't do it like that. What I do is, do you make enough money to take care of yourself as an adult? If $25,000 is the money that you have from earning on a job, but you still manage to keep an apartment, pay your car note, pay um, food, electric, phone, anything like that, and you still can get that done, okay, that's an adult. It's not that the person needs to make $100,000 or $200,000 or $300,000 or be a millionaire. Because for one, if, if, if you're asking someone to make that, the first question that you need to ask is, do you make that? You can't ask anything of someone else that you're not doing yourself. And so that's why I have a problem with this sort of new age trend where people want to say, especially women want to say, well, he needs to do this, he needs to do that, he needs to have this, he needs to do this or whatever. Okay, but do you have it? And a lot, and some of these women, they do have their own places and they do make um, uh, fair enough money. I mean, if you're a person who works in corporate America and you're making $250,000 a year, I do believe you need someone who works at that level, who understands that level. If you've got a person who's making $25,000 a year, they don't really understand the difference between, in terms of work ethic, 25 and 250. I know that may sound harsh, but that's a different type of work ethic. It makes sense to me. I teach college. So it makes sense to me really to get with the person who understands uh, teaching. I, uh, uh, or because uh, teaching is, is more about uh, self-study, self-reliance, um, um, initiation. It's almost like you're running yourself as a business. You're getting a paycheck, but you have to um, um, create the situations yourself. Okay, if a person is only used to clocking in and clocking out on the job, clocking in work and clock on the job, um, uh, but you have to, in your field, initiate a lot of the ideals and and develop those ideals, and then distribute um, um, uh, assignments of that uh, of those ideals, and delegate authority, and supervise people, manage budgets, things like that. There's so much more that you have to do at your two hundred and fifty thousand dollar level 
than at the $25,000 level. And there may be a clash between you two because when you bring your work home, sometimes it's just unavoidable. You are a salaried person, whereas he may be an hourly person. And so a lot of people don't understand uh, when you are choosing careers and when you're marrying someone who has a career. Um, I was thinking about the Kevin Costner situation and he's going through a divorce with his wife and she was all mad that he was spending too much time acting and things like that. Kevin Costner has had major, 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 major roles. He's Kevin Costner. But this um, uh, role that he's had in, in a series, the name of the series just has um, eluded me. Uh, that's one of those, strangely enough, it's kind of like a breakout role that a non-celebrity person who just comes on the Hollywood scene will get. Because some, it's funny how you get more recognition and breakout and more opportunities in your later years than you do in your former years, your previous years. So she's complaining about him having to work and things like that. Okay, well, you married Carrie, uh, you married Kevin Costner. You married the celebrity, the, the A-list celebrity Kevin Costner. What did you think? What did you think was going to happen when you did that? And so that's why I say um, it's not always smart to marry someone when you are already a, a, a high performing person in a field where the other person is not necessarily high performing in their field. There's performance, but not high performing where uh, the consequences are higher uh, if that person does not meet state of uh, quotas and things like that. Right. So I don't have a I necessarily don't necessarily I don't necessarily have a problem with someone who's making twenty five thousand. What I look at is, can you take care of yourself? Can you as a grown individual? And if you're making twenty five, thirty, forty thousand, I'm not going to have a, necessarily a problem with you. But also don't have a problem with me because I'm making what I'm making. Right. And because what I do has a has a bit of a high performance um, quality to it. And so when you're thinking about the homosexual squatter, they have to be able to get and keep a job, keep that job for more than a year, not get on the job and hop from job to job, job hopping. Like I saw a lot of, of situations in a, um, in a shelter, shelter hoppers. When one shelter ended their term, they just go to the next shelter. That shelter could last about three months or something like that. They stay there for three months and they come back to the previous shelter. They never plan for the transition out of the shelter. It's like a just wheel. They're just roaming around on a uh, running around on a hamster's wheel, and they're every they're everywhere and nowhere at the same time. So they need to keep that job for more than a year. They need to keep get and keep a place, whatever place can. Um, work for you. When I was coming out of the shelter and I was still going through my transition, uh, I got a motel. I got the extended stay motel. I stayed in there um, 2013 to about 2022. 2022. That's what I could afford. The money that I was making as an adjunct uh, adjunct professor, that's all I could, uh, I could afford. I didn't have the money to make the uh, three times rent. Uh, to meet that qualification. I didn't have that. So I did with what I did and I planned. I wrote the books. I create the video lessons. I had a vision, uh, a vision for myself uh, and I stayed consistent on that job. I didn't quit that job uh, out of being upset or anything like that. I went on ahead and resigned back in 2021, July because of the pandemic because I couldn't get classes. And I thought, well, maybe I can go to go back to San Diego because it looked like I could get a job there. And then something started to happen in San Diego because of the pandemic, the COVID crisis. But uh, but but I was called back fall 2022 for a temporary full time job, which made it a possible made it possible for me to then make the three uh, meet the three times rent requirement and a deposit. Right. Because everybody is asking for a deposit today. Uh, 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 one month's rent deposit. 
and uh, make that and then uh, move into an apartment, which I've been in since November 2022. Okay, so then um, uh, it took it took some time. It took some time. But wherever you are, get somewhere and get stable is it goes back to what our uh, aunts and big mamas used to say, get somewhere and sit down. You keep jumping from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing, and you're not accomplishing anything. So if they can get and keep a job, keep that job for more than a year, get and keep a place of their own, not moving in with somebody else, and not moving in with a woman, right, in this case, or a woman moving in with a man. If you're moving in with a roommate situation, you're both on the lease. So that means you're not a homosexual squatter, and you're not homeless because you both are on the lease. But if you're moving in someone and being a roommate, but your name is not on the lease, you're still homeless. Uh, get and keep a place. Pay for that place on their own and without help and with and with their own money they get from working on a job. And then stay in that place for a minimum of a year and then reassess. And so if you look at it like this, any job that you get, you need to stay on it for at least two years. It gives you record. The record of working, and then it gives you a recommendation letter if you have to get it. And then you reassess in, at the end of that second year and say, okay, I know I can do another uh, two to three years. So that gives you five years of employment now reassess. Okay, if you give me, if you stay on the job for two years, that means you can pay for your place. That gives you two years. And then you reassess uh, in the third year whether or not you want to stay in that place or whether or not you want to move on to another apartment. Okay. Then if you're going to do that, or if you're not going to do that, you keep the job for another three years that keeps you in a place for five years. Keeps you on a job for five years, keeps you in a place for five years. So that's these are the questions that you have to ask that are implicit in what the homosexual squatter must do, because otherwise you're just going to be taking care of a child, a grown child. And that's not fair. That's not fair. Like I said, there are exceptions to the rule. If a situation has happened where you lost your job, lost your place, even an eviction, uh, lost something due to um, a natural disaster, a flooding or something like that, those are completely uh, different circumstances. Pandemic, right? Everyone is still recuperating and healing from the pandemic. And so you may have to exercise some patience with that person. But if you see a situation where the person would rather do one thing, do illegal behavior, uh, than do another, they don't want to change. One of the most important things you need to consider when you are reassessing your relationship with the homosexual squatter is that you cannot bear their burden. You just cannot do it. Whatever burden that they had prior to meeting you is something that they had prior to meeting you. Whatever trauma that they had prior to meeting you is something that they had prior to meeting you. You can't bear that bread. You cannot bear that burden. You have your own. You have your own traumatic childhood situations and uh, relationships with your parents and siblings and, and job situations. You got your own burden. So you cannot bear the burden of a homosexual squatter. Only that person can carry their own load. Only that person can decide when to let go of that load. Only that person can choose to move forward. You cannot walk out their steps for them. You cannot walk out their steps for them. If you think about um, like the visual of two people walking down the road, right? One, both have, have bags on their back, right? And then one of the people says, oh, oh, I'm tired. Well, this bag is heavy. And then the other person says, Okay, well, my bag is not that heavy. Let me go on ahead and carry yours for a good hour or something like that. And the person so quickly gives you, gives the other person a bag. Not even thinking about it or anything like that. Not even thinking, say, I don't want you to hold my bag. It's my bag, you know. Uh, or, or even maybe transferring some items in the bag into the other person's bag. No, they just take off that load and give it to the other person. Now, even though your bag is not that heavy, now, with wearing their bag on your back, it seems like both bags are heavier than they should be because that's the way it is. Both bags are heavier than they should be because that's not your load. The load that he was carrying was a load that he could carry. The only reason why he didn't want to carry it is because he didn't want to carry it. That's it. He didn't want to carry it. 
And so if he didn't want to carry, it could be one of two things. Either he's lazy and not accountable, not responsible, or he has put too much on his own back. He could be the type of person who has put too much on his own back. And instead of addressing the items in the bag and saying, I can't carry this too much. I can't carry this uh, too long and forever. He just decides to take off the whole bag and put it on the other person's back. And the person who had little in his bag did not reassess his bag and reassess the load to his bag because whatever was in his bag, he could carry. That means that whatever in his bag was not as light as, as he might think. It was a bag that he could carry. So then when he assumes because he don't have a lot in his bag that he can carry somebody else's bag, he is he, he is assuming incorrectly. He's assuming incorrectly because then you then take on that load. You don't even know what is going on in his bag. And a bag is like a metaphor for life. You don't know what is going on in his life. And you're taking on the responsibility of his bag because he said, oh, it's heavy. It's heavy because you put all that crap in there. You keep uh, having dating rotations. You keep moving from place to place. You won't keep a job. You won't keep a place. You uh, keep provoking situations at your job. You won't do what you're supposed to do. You won't live the. You won't live a straight life. So therefore, you keep collecting all these um, bad decisions that you're putting in your bag and that you now have to carry. And instead of assessing those bad decisions, you just throw your bag on somebody else. And then what happens in that situation? The person carrying uh, his his light bag and the heavy bag of the other person. Uh, he ends up carrying even more bags for the person because truth be told, if you don't address your bad decision making, you're just going to keep up, uh, keep picking up more bad decisions. So then as they are walking down the road, one person is carrying two bags. The other person is uh, uh, walking footloose and fancy free. And then he continues to pick up more decisions. He continues to pick this up, pick this up, pick this up to the, to the point that he finds out he needs a bag. And then he puts all that in the bag and he just keeps stuffing it and stuffing it and stuffing it. And then he returns to the pattern that he's been using. Oh, this bag is heavy. This bag is heavy. And like a dummy, we still say, we say, oh, oh, I can help you with that. Oh, let me help you with that. Oh, I got some time. Oh, yeah, I'm a... a yeah, I'm near that um, th that store. Yeah, I can pick that up for you. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, you can come live with me. Oh, and I got this extra room. Ain't nobody living with me, girl. You know how I am. I live by myself. Yeah, you can come live with me. Oh, it's okay to let your boyfriend come here. Yeah, he's he's kind of struggling right now, girl. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I've been there too with a man. I get it, girl. Um, um, oh, you don't have your rent to that? Well, yeah, I get it. I understand. I know. I know how it goes. Maybe I give you about a couple of months to get yourself together and things like that, right? Um, oh, you got a new dress on? How you get a new dress? I thought you couldn't, I, I thought you didn't have the money. Oh, well, you know, I got some money. I just, sometimes I'll kind of save some money. I needed a new dress. I'm trying to get a um, a new job. Oh, you trying to get a new job? Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to get a, uh, a new job so, so then I can get my own place. And if the girl, you ain't got to worry about getting your own place. It's okay. Just you know, get your job and then, you know, pay a little bit rent. You, you don't even have to pay that much, right? Okay. So, so we do all this. We keep carrying their burden. That's on us. That is literally on us. We keep playing ourselves. That's on us. We need to stop that. It is not our burden. We're not saying technically that your issue is not my responsibility. Okay. Because there may come a time you where you may have to help somebody. You may have to let somebody come live with you. And in that time, you're going to have to set the right boundaries. You're going to have to set the right uh, strategies. Because if you don't set the right boundaries, uh, they could take over your house and become a squatter in your house. And it's hard to evict them. If they have paid anything, anything at all, or if there is an agreement that, okay, if you do this, you can stay here or whatever. 
and they tell the judge and you say, yeah, judge, I did say that. Okay, you can't kick them out. If they receive mail at your place, you can't kick them out, uh, but through eviction. And then that creates a mental and psychological and spiritual and financial load on you that is not fair, but you have to accept because you let the situation in. You let the homosexual in. And so if you're going to let the homosexual in, then you have to accept all of the, uh, uh, the consequences of the situation. So you cannot bear their burden. You cannot do it. Whatever they need to work out in their life, they got to work it out. And it's going to have to be apart from you because they don't want to listen to you. They don't want to receive your instruction. They don't want to receive your uh, wisdom. They don't want to receive the truth. They don't want to change. So you bearing their burden is, is, is only going to wear you down. You're not going to be able to get anything done that you need to get done in your life. You're not going to be able to accomplish your own uh, 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 dreams. You're going to uh, struggle every time you get home from work because not only is the job going to be stressful because of the situation at the house, but when you come back to the situation at the house, that's even more stressful. You can't go to sleep in that situation. You have no rest with a homosexual squatter. Even if you both are giving each other sex, it's something about the situation that is wearing on you that you cannot get. You can be sleeping in the same bed, just finished having sex and good sex at that. And, and something about it still turns your stomach, still turns your mind still moves you closer and closer and closer into mental insanity. And and it's not going to work. Now, as a born-again Christian today, I'm not doing that. I'm not in fornication situations. God has already told me who my husband is going to be. And I'm going to, I'm, and I'm in um, a, a healing period prior to that. So when I make these comments, don't think that I am advocating for um, fornication. I'm not advocating for that anymore. But uh, even in a fornication situation, you're taking on their load. There's some sort of sexual issue going on with them that you feel like you got to solve. And there's some sort of sexual issue going on with you that you feel like they got to solve. And you're both coming together soul tied, trying to, uh, trying to solve your sexual issues uh, when all you're doing is just repeating patterns, re, uh, extending the situation, the situation is going to become volatile after a while because it's something about the situation that is not good. No matter what you try to do to convince yourself that 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 I'm making this choice to be to, to be with this person in this way, you are not happy. I promise you, you are not happy. And so only that person can truly decide when to let go of that load. So if there's a load like a person who was sexually abused or a person who grew up with a, uh, a mother or, or, or father with an addiction problem or a person uh, who grew up in a toxic dynamic where they, are, where they were scapegoated um, uh, and had to, had to battle with their siblings or something like that. Um, if they were homeless as a child, right? Or if they had a mean uh, primary caregiver who mistreated them, uh, who beat them, uh, who punished them incessantly, if they have all those types of issues, those types of loads, you can't solve that. Do you, is it possible that you may have some insight into it? Yep. Sure. Yeah. Because you might have gone through exactly some of the same things, but eventually you're going to have to turn them over to a resource. You're going to have to turn them over to a person who is actually licensed and skilled at helping people in that way. And that's why I keep saying you are not a resource. You're not a rehabilitation center. You're not a shelter. You're not a, a store. You're not an all convenience store that, that they can get all their different uh, things for food and medicine and milk and, and liquor and all that kind of stuff. You cannot do that. You're going to find yourself becoming them. So only that person can choose to move forward. So that means they have to consciously and be intentional about moving forward. It goes back to the platoon. It goes back to the platoon. Is is when the platoon leader says forward march, you're either going to forward march or you're not. You're either going to advance or you're not. 
So only that person can choose. That means it's their choice. You cannot choose on their behalf. That's why we need to stop being mothers to grown men. That is on us. That is our fault. We need to expect more from grown men. That you are a grown up. Whether you're making 25000 30000 40000 If you need to take care of yourself. You do not need to rely on a woman to take care of you. Men need to stop moving in with women. And women need to stop moving in men. And we need to uh, uh, live our lives separately so that we can uh, learn what we need to learn, understand what we need to learn, guide ourselves as adults so that we can see the situation through an adult lens. Because when you move in somebody, you're seeing it through a child's lens. When when you move in, when you move with somebody, you're seeing it through a child's lens because you're looking for a parent. So only that person can choose to move forward. This means that you should do nothing for the homosexual squatter. If the homosexual squatter is not willing to go into a shelter or rehabilitation place to get help and shelter and access to permanent supported housing or resources, then the homosexual squatter is not willing to live apart from the streets. The homosexual squatter wants to live on the streets because living on the streets is more convenient. The person has more authority. The person does not have to comply with authority. The person creates his or her own authority. The person gives the streets more credibility. So the place that you, so place is uh, placed uh, in quotation marks because remember they were using you as a place. They didn't need shelter. They didn't need food. They didn't need sex. They just needed a place. They needed a place to wander, to uh, to uh, to bring chaos, to dwell, to be a vagabond, things like that. They just needed a place to do that. And they could get that through any other uh, woman or any, any other man. People are heavy now in these uh, polyamorous types, um, type situations. They all have dating rotations or whatever because they're trying to secure territorial dominance over the person and their resources so they can make sure that they have whatever they need to have. So in other words, they're looking at all these individual people as uh, parents. The man who has a dating rotation uh, of five women, five women is looking at all of them as parents. The woman who has a dating rotation at, of, of five men is looking at all those men as parents. That's what they're trying to go back to. They're trying to go back to the womb. It's a womb mentality. Because um, why, we, why do you feel like you always need to go and live with somebody? So the, so the homosexual squatter is not willing. If, if the homosexual squatter, squatter is not willing to go into a shelter or rehabilitation place to get help, and shelter and access to permanent support housing, then the squatter, the homosexual squatter is not willing to live apart from the street. The streets, again, have more credibility. They So the streets can be one street or multiple streets. So one night they sleep on one street, it goes well. Then they sleep on and see if, and then if, if they can't find their same spot again, like the next night, okay, then they have to go to another street. So if another street works well for them, still well for them, okay, Okay, so I got two streets that I can work with. In my mind, I got two streets I can work with. So then if they come, right, and they go back and forth between those two streets, they know they have two options. So then what happens when they don't have the two options anymore? The space is being taken up by other homeless people. Then they try to go find another uh, a street. Well, something happens on that street, and they realize that, it's going to be danger for them. And so they say, okay, I can't go to that third street. But then they return to the two street options. And one of the streets is available to pitch their tent. And so as long as they know that they can find a place, they can find a place to pitch their tent, then they are good. They're solid. And as long as there's consistency in that, they can uh, pack up their tent, make the rounds with the soup kitchens, maybe go and talk to uh food stamp office, things like that or whatever. 
um, then they have productivity for their life. And as long as they can come back to the streets, to the two main streets that they know work well for them, the options, uh, then they're, they're not willing to live apart from the streets. I have heard, um, I have seen video documentaries of people who were given a motel to live in, but they wouldn't sleep on the bed. Somehow sleeping on the bed, is it, it, it just felt weird to them. So they would rather sleep on the floor. If you think about Tom Hanks and Castaway, when they finally found him and then they put him in a hotel, a uh, real fancy hotel, that thing looked like a suite. Uh, where did he sleep? He didn't sleep in the bed. He slept on the floor and he kept turning on and off that uh, lamp because his mind was still on the floor, on the ground. And his mind was still in the cave. And no matter what you tried to do to convince him by giving him great surroundings, giving him food and great surroundings and things like that, he was not going to be convinced by that. He was only convinced that sleeping on the ground, sleeping uh, on the floor in that hotel, turning on and off that light was the most productive thing that he had going on in his life for the many years that he was cast away on that island. So then he got used to that. Now, did he uh, eventually um, uh, change? Uh, maybe, I don't know. Because when you think about it, he went to go see Kelly and they had their moment. Then he went to go see his friend at his friend's house, okay? Then he had his moment there. And then later, um, uh, he takes a trip to uh, 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 town with the package that he saved. And he went to uh, find a house, left a note, left the package. And then comes out and he sees a woman and the woman, a uh, real nice lady or whatever. And then he sees how, how the... The logo on the package matched the logo on the uh, truck. And so he's at this crossroad, this four-way crossroad about what, what decisions he need to make now. And to me, it would have been better to put him in a house so that he moved from homeless to house. I understand dramatically in terms of film drama, uh, th that you leave him at at that crossroad in limbo. Now, does he turn around in the film and he turns around and looks down at the road and realizes that actually may be, be the direction he needs to go in? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But we haven't, we haven't by the end of the film established whether or not he can have his own place. He's moving from place to place. Even at the beginning of the film, he is... I think he is living with Kelly. They're supposed to be engaged or something like that. And their engagement was very long. And so in some ways he was a homosexual squatter in her life because why can't you make a decision about, about marriage? And so then when he goes missing and then he's presumed dead, she goes on and marries um, um, her dentist and they have a house and a child and, and, and everything, uh, stability. His death did not create instability in her in the sense that that she knew that she still needed to keep a place. She still needed to keep a house. She still needed to stay in her marriage. Uh, there may have been some uh, some psychological instability because of the way that he was presumed dead, right? But he he managed to do that. But him going him going to and fro on his job, even though he's working his job, that's his career. And then him him going to Kelly's house after he's found, and then the friend's house after he's found, and then the lady's house after, after he's found, and then also the hotel, does not tell me that the situation is left um, stable to me. And um, and at the end, he's still looking for a place. Now this may be an over exaggeration. I'm not calling uh, uh, the Tom Hanks character in Castaway a homosexual squatter uh, because they did give him some money, some work, and uh, I mean, I mean, uh, some money, right? I guess lawsuit or something like that. But it, to me, it would have been good for him to um, meet her, go and meet her, uh, 
go and date or something like that, but then have him as a character walking into his own apartment with a box and now setting to task to be alive again. To me, that's what that actually would have been better um, um, as a strategy uh, to do because then it moves him from being, again, it moves him from being homeless to now uh, being able to work again, being able to function again and things like that. Another situation that I realized when I was researching homeless, um, homelessness, chronic homelessness, and I was doing a second master's in psychology that I haven't finished yet. And I don't know when I go back to it. Uh, but the research literature uh, showed me that some homeless people feel homeless in a home. That even though they were able to get permanent supported housing, PSA, uh, PSH, PSH, uh, and it's under the housing first model, even though they were able to get housing, when they finally get housing, they fe they feel like homeless in the home. Uh, and then they also noted through survey that that they wish they had gotten some kind of financial counseling about how to how to to have a bank account, how how to balance a uh, checkbook, how to live as a non homeless person. Yeah, there you go as a non-homeless person, if they had received, they said, they suggested had, had they received some kind of orientation about that, it would have been, it might've been better for them, right? But then they were also noting that many of the, uh, the housing was in bad neighborhoods where they were always confronted with drug addicts, uh, prostitutes, things like that. And so again, those are the types of people who are also looking uh, to squat somewhere because if you are, in that permanent supported housing, but you're not using it to your benefit to actually get yourself better, then you're basically squatting. Even if you're, even if you are permitted to live there because of the policy, the housing first policy, you're still, you're still essentially a homosexual squatter. So if the person is not willing to go into a shelter, a uh, rehabilitation place, um, and get access to resources, even if they can't get access to permanent supportive housing, then they're not willing to live apart from the streets. That's really what that is. They're not willing to live apart from the streets. And the homosexual squatter wants to live on the streets because living on the streets is just more convenient. Do you know how easy it is, is to just stay in the convenient aspects of your adult life than to uh, take a chance take a risk and move out of one convenience into um, a better life that you are envisioning yourself. What people like to do is they like to do the extremes. They have a dream of their shift that they want to become this. And what they'll do is they either quit the job or not have a job or go straight after the uh, dream, but not have a plan. What I believe is better strategy, keep the job, keep the job, and let the job fund your dream. So do the 8 to 5, do the 10.30 to 7, do the 11.30 p.m. to 8, right? Save, uh, pay your bills, save a fraction of that, right? And put towards your, um, your, um, your dream. So if your dream is to write a book, then write a book when you come home. Or if you are too tired from a night shift, go ahead and get your sleep. And then uh, do do um, a chapter or do two or three pages. Do something along the way. Don't put so much um, pressure on you that you have to perform and have a have a chapter. Sometimes it's better to get the dialogue. Sometimes it's better to work on the dialogue. It's better to work on the scene development. It's better to work on the character outline. Do as much as you can. Keep a journal so that so that you're not procrastinating the learning process because even if you try to skip ahead or you wait too long you're still procrastinating the learning process and that's what procrastination basically is and so they give the streets more authority the people on the streets all of the people on the streets are homeless just like them and they're giving them more authority do they have authority in the uh present okay if you ask them where's the best place to uh to pitch a tent and they tell you oh here's the best place to pitch a tent yeah they have authority right? However, they don't have authority about how to live life as a stable um, individual long-term.
because they would rather continue to stay in the current situation that they're in than to actually say, hey, I got to, I, I, I can't do this anymore. I just, I, I just can't do this anymore. So the person does not have to, they don't, when they live on the streets, they don't have to comply with authority, which is ironic because many, there have been many street sweeps of uh, throwing away the homeless, uh, homeless people's uh, camps, of uh, the, uh, the camping. All these homeless encampments now are under fire. Many of the local local governments, uh, mayors and managers are now making decisions about these homeless encampments and that, um, like in San Diego, I know for sure that if there is an open bed in a shelter, you have to go in there. Like you have to go. If you don't go, they're going to give you a ticket or send you to jail, right? Uh, and so even though there's this idea that if I live freely and I just live homeless and I live freely and I don't really have to um, respect rules or anything like that, eventually you're going to have to comply with authority because you don't own the city property. You don't own the land. And so anyone can ask you to leave. So um, the person gives the streets more credibility. As long as I can pitch a tent on this street or this street or this street, this street, then I then I'm good. I don't need to have a place. But then one uh, one night on the street turns into two, two turns into months, months turn into years, and you realize you've been living on the streets for 20 years. So with this situation, you can't do anything because if they give more authority to instability and unstable living, and you have authority on stable living and stability, the two of you are going to clash. And that's why these uh, situations tend to turn tragic because you take in somebody who doesn't believe what you believe. You are taking in somebody who who has already voiced to you that we're not going to listen to you and it doesn't matter what you say and I'm going to do whatever I want to do. You can't have that person in your house. You can't even have really that person in your life. It's going to be dangerous. All right, conclusion. So homosexual squatters uh, at the end of the, of the day are wanderers. Uh, these are people who abandon you in a time of trouble. They live by second, minute, hour, day, and then continue that process after that full day. Uh, they create a vision of homosexual squatting. That means that they are not ready to exit that mindset. And just because you have a different mindset doesn't mean that they're ready to exit that mindset. There's a um, change in our mindset chart that I teach in my English classes, uh, the 1301 classes, and it comes from Carol Dweck and uh, her book, The Minds, uh, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. And I think it's a little bit more of that title uh, where she's talking about the difference between fixed mindset and growth mindset. And fixed mindset is that you believe your abilities are uh, fixed, uh, that they cannot change over time. Right. And that uh, when you are confronted with obstacles, you tend to uh, believe uh, that that failure is, is essentially the only option, right? That you fail at everything, so it makes sense for you to fail. Growth mindset is that you believe your abilities can change over time and that, uh, that you're very good at listening to uh, criticism, right? You, uh, you sort of assess it and apply it to your life. If you come across an obstacle that is in your way, that is affecting you, that may be setting you back, you look at that, assess it and say, okay, now how best can I um, um, change my understanding about that? And then you change your understanding, you apply a better understanding, and then you continue on your way. Think about fixed mindset and growth mindset in terms of the classroom when you have to take a test. So the fixed mindset person it's always the type of person who says, okay, I'm an A student. I'm an A student. When you say that, however, um, when you say that you are an A student, you run the risk of uh, not taking on more risk. Because if you are used to only receiving A's, you're not going to take on more risk to learn more things because then that's going to affect your perception of your A. Because what if you take on more risk and you don't do so well on the um, test 
and you only get a B plus, and then that affects how you do things. So you would rather just not do it at all, okay? The growth mindset person would be the type of person who is in a class, and it could be a math class, and they say, okay, I got a 60 on the first test. What do I need to uh, learn? Okay, I'm missing something. So then they will study more, uh, and then they may get a 76 on the next test. Okay, so I'm doing I'm, I'm I'm doing a little bit better, right? So, but that means that they're four points shot short, short of an 80. So that means that that there's still opportunity for them to move from a C to a B. So then they continue to study more and more and more, uh, get help, get tutoring, and then they get an 85 on the next test. Okay, so so now they have moved from a 60, 76 to an 85. So now they are feeling much more encouraged that they can learn this thing, this, this thing called math. And so they can stay at the 85 and still be, and still reflect a person with a growth mindset, right? Because they were willing to change and learn more from the 60 grade. Uh, but there's still an opportunity to get an A because they're five, sh uh, five points short of a 90. And so uh, they um, they ram up um, all of their study habits. They get more tutoring. They do as much as they can to learn it and learn it well. And then they actually end up um, end up getting a 92 on the next test. So again, 60, 76, 85 to 92. And that's what a growth mindset looks like. That even though they could have been happy with the 85, because maybe they set the goal to pass the class and passing the class is with a 70, right? Uh, they set a goal to pass the class, but then they realize, you know what? I got an 85. I wonder if I can get a 90. Yeah, I think I'm going to go for that, right? And they ended up with a 92. Now, in the, at the end of the day, they probably averaged uh, B, B minus C plus, right, in the class, right, because of the different grades and plus. And plus because of other of other factors right but they were willing to look at the 60. they were they were willing to look at the, the fixed mindset will be so preoccupied with the 60 that they don't want to learn they say that it's unfair it's not right okay she took off wrong points uh more points for this then they will uh, begin to compare their 60 with somebody else's 60 and see through the lens. Yeah, but how she give you, how she give you points and she didn't give me points when, when in reality, the math teacher took off points for everybody, right? Uh, if you're getting a 60, uh, but they don't see it like that. They can't see beyond the fact that they got the 60 and it's not right and it's not fair and they're not going to do anything to try harder. They're just going to uh, stay in it, and they may decide to not do anything at all and fail the class. Strangely enough, even though they believe they may be an A student, they may actually purposely just let it go and fail the class altogether. Okay? Either way, they're not going to do anything. And so what they'll do is they are the types of uh, people who will go and talk to your boss, you know, the teacher's boss, and go and, and talk to the dean and go and write letters and go and talk to their father and things like that. When the actual goal would be to figure out how did I get the 60? In other words, how? at least if I look at, look at it at the next grade level, how did I get the 60 and not the 70? Okay, then that gives you some time to reflect and critically assess and think about what am I doing that I'm I'm getting a 60 and what am I doing that I'm getting a 60 and not at least passing? And then the more you stay with that and you and and you go over the math problems and you think about it and you wonder about it, okay, well maybe I should okay, maybe I should do okay, maybe I should just do this. Okay. Maybe I should do this. Maybe I should do you come up with different ways and the more you do that, the more you become interested in actually learning the concept. And so you stick with it and you learn it and then you do better and you get to at least a 70. And then and then you're still mad with a fixed mindset, uh, but you are moving yourself from fixed to growth, not realizing it. You're moving yourself from fixed to growth. And if you continue that pattern, 
you'll find that you are capable of moving your abilities from one type of mindset to the next. Because you can't say, I always pose this question that I got from an article. Can a person from a fixed mindset change to a growth mindset? And I ask my students and they automatically say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because people live in aspirational thinking. They live in hope. They live in, oh yeah, absolutely, right? But in order for you to uh, to um, fulfill one of the qualities of the growth mindset, you're going to have to address your fixed mindset. And one of those qualities of the fixed mindset is that you ignore criticism. The growth mindset is going to accept criticism because the growth mindset in this case is willing to go to the tutor. It's willing, willing to ask the teacher about the problem. And then the teacher tells them to go to the tutoring center. And then the growth mindset person goes to the tutoring center. And the tutoring uh, tutor tells them what he did wrong. And then he self-corrects. And then he moves on. And so the only way that you're going to be sure that you can uh, uh, transition from fixed to growth is that you got to address at least your inability to receive criticism. That's what's going on with a lot of homosexual squatters, ho homeless people, that they're not willing to uh, address the criticism. They're not willing to self-correct. They would rather stay in the mindset of homosexual squatting. They have set it up as a vision for their life. Um, if you think about vision, think about vision statements that a company might create. Say, for instance, like we're looking at, you know, McDonald's. And, and, and I don't have, uh, have their vision statement right in front of me, so I'm just going to uh, kind of fake it for a minute. So if their vision is, we want to become the premier or the preferred burger for, uh, uh, for people who like burgers, meaning that out of all the options that people have to get a burger, they prefer to go to McDonald's. That doesn't mean that they don't eat other burgers, right? It's just that they prefer to eat McDonald's, meaning that if they are in a rush and there is a Whataburger or Burger King on one, one side of the uh, street and, and across the street is um, a McDonald's, McDonald's may be, have easier convenience because then you may see a, Madon a, a McDonald's on every block. Okay, then that means that McDonald's has more stores, more restaurants than the Burger King. So then that's how they might become the preferred burger place for people who want a burger because then it's just easy to step into a McDonald's, go get a little hamburger and some fries uh, and a drink, and then I can go back to work. Sometimes it has a lot to do with convenience. Uh, because I don't think it always has a lot to do with the taste of the burger unless it's a... Uh, it's a um, a premier burger, a um, um, a certain type of burger that each each um, each restaurant offers. Some people love a Big Mac, but some people love love a Water Burger. Some people love a Jack in the Box. Some people uh, love like independent restaurant, um, you know, type burgers. Right, the meat is real thick. But what what the vision statement is suggesting is that we as McDonald's want to become the preferred burger out of all the burger options that you have okay so then look at the vision in that way and then the mission statements are individual products things like that that you attach on uh to mission i mean uh as a mission statement all of of departments things like that so then when you say that look at the vision of the homosexual squatter i prefer being a homosexual squatter out of all the options that I have as an adult, I prefer and and and, and you know split it up for a minute. I prefer being a homosexual, and I prefer squatting. And now I prefer being a homosexual squatter. And out of all the decisions and all the options that I have available to me, and the opportunities that I could create. Uh, to be stable, sustain stability, uh, be self-sufficient, I would rather be, I prefer to be a homosexual squatter. And that's their mindset. They are not ready to exit that mindset. 
So letting them come and live and washing their sheets and clothes and cleaning their rooms and feeding them and giving them sex and all that kind of stuff, that is not going to change their mindset. They want to be in that mindset. And the longer you stay in that situation, the longer it's going to be hard for you to get out of that mindset because eventually you will become them. So homosexual, homosexual squatters are wanderers. They abandon you in a time of trouble. Uh, they live by second minute hour day, continue that process after that full day. They create a vision of homosexual squatting. They are not ready to exit that mindset. All right, so um, visit the virginawhitefavors.com for tips and resources. On that site, you can find videos um, and downloadable documents. It's still a work in progress, but the vision of the site is to be the preferred online curriculum you need for life recovery. So I have a lot of uh, videos and um, information about overcoming setback and then pursuing life recovery. So there will be a companion to this audio lecture is the uh, new title will be the homosexual squatter overcoming homosexual setback a reflection workbook companion so many of the ideals i basically created an opportunity for you to journal also visit my youtube channel regina y favors so youtube.com forward slash at regina y favors and so you will see a lot of videos um, um, i do on different topics and then I have an online store, which is Regina Y. Favors, Arthur.com. And then the Amazon Arthur page, which is Amazon.com forward slash Arthur forward slash Regina Y. Favors. So take some time to visit these um, online resources, gain some insight from them, download some videos, watch some videos, buy some of the titles. And this will help you to understand the homosexual uh, squatter, but then also how to overcome setback in your life. Any type of setback. Uh, I have a title on life recovery after romantic hastiness, um, different types of titles on how to prepare mentoring, uh, life plans, for, uh, life, favors sample life plan, uh, and then also some marketing materials, things like that. So take some time to visit, subscribe, and follow. Um, and thank you very much for listening.